Today, the tour pays its respects to the victims and the survivors of the First World War. The tranquility of the countryside belies the bloody battles that raged in this region. And I welcome to Stage 7 of the Tour de France. Stage 7 from Epinay through to Nancy, it's 234.5 kilometres. The second longest stage of the race. Intermediate sprint at the 86 kilometre mark, two category four climbs towards the end, coming at 17 and 5.5 kilometres to go. It's then a tricky descent through to the finish line. The scenes at the start in Epinay before the stage got underway. Not clear skies, but at least it's not raining. It's still overcast, but we do have our fingers crossed that that's as bad as it gets. Peter Sagan and Vincenzo Nibli, two former teammates, clearly enjoying each other's company. Cyril Mlewam in the King of the Mountains jersey. Two points maximum up for grabs on today's stage with just the two Category 4 climbs. The big mountains to come on the weekend. The flag coming in to get racing started. A slight cross tailwind early on in the stage. It forced a fair bit of action. It's been a reasonably quick start. The first two hours of racing, the average speed has been 42.7 kilometres per hour. Breakaway group of six riders have formed at the front. Their advantage at this point is three minutes and seven seconds. There's nobody in the move who is a threat to the yellow jersey of Vincenzo Nibali. The best place to overall from this breakaway contingent is Martin Alminger, the Swiss national champion from the IAM cycling squad. That is he on the left-hand side of the screen as he rolls through to the fronts. He sits at 9 minutes and 25 seconds down. This is Alexander Pichot at the back of the group in the green colours for the Europe car team. Matthew Boucher in the black colours for Trek Factory Racing. Good to see the former American national champion into the break. This is Elminger, number 193. Nicola Ede is also in there riding for Corfidis. Anthony de Laplace is the man in the white colours from the Breton Sachet squad. And for Net Appendura, rounding out the six men off the front, it's Bartosz Hrozowski, a Polish rider from that wildcard team. And like everybody on the Net Appendura team, he is a debutant in the tour. All of them making a start for the first time. And they've already made a bit of an impact. I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of them over the weekend once we get to the mountains. The crowds have been good on the side of the road the last few days, but not quite as big as what we saw for the first three days in Great Britain. They've raised the benchmark for Tours de France of the future, particularly for the Grand Depart. Back to the main peloton. Hand up down towards the uh, back of the main field for the uh, Europe car squad. This looks like Nicky Terpstra at the back of the group. It is Nicky Terpstra, the man who won Paru Bay earlier on this year. And is amongst the voices declaring that the Pave doesn't belong in the Tour de France. You just saw the red number going by. That was Louis Angel Mate, who was in the break yesterday and given the award of the most combative on the stage. It's all green at the front with the Cannondale squad. They have the almost unbackable favourite, Peter Sagan. The word almost comes into the fray because of the amount of crashes that Peter Sagan has had. A lot of falls for the man who wears the green jersey. He says nothing is broken and he hopes that like the Wolverine, he rejuvenates. Stana lining up towards the front, making sure that they keep the team leader and the race leader out of trouble. They have ridden a flawless tour thus far. But we must remember we're only coming towards the end of the first week. This is Matthew Boucher at the front. Trek Factory Racing. Yesterday. They were close with Danny Van Poppel. He looked like he was in a good position, but he punched it at two kilometres to go. So unfortunate for the youngest rider in the race. He might find the final climbs today just a little bit difficult. Time will tell. This war memorial was inaugurated back in 1925 at the top of the mound of what was a former town hall in this region 
There were nine towns that were destroyed throughout the First World War. Six of them, they didn't rebuild, and this is one of them. There is a museum underneath as well that houses plenty of weapons and tools and other objects that were found at this site. And you can see for yourself the damage that was done. That memorial stands where the town hall used to be and the surrounding part of the area was formerly a town. A stark reminder of the battles that were fought here between 1914 and 1918. Somewhere in the vicinity of nine million lives lost throughout what was known as the Great War, the war to end all wars. Unfortunately, it didn't live up to its moniker. Team Cannondale at the front. Sagan is the favourite despite the falls that he's had throughout the first few days. And if not for the fall on stage one, Simon Gerrans would almost be equal favourite with him. They might have a few other cards to play though, the Oka Green Edge team. They'll be hoping that Michael Albersini can get himself in amongst the mix. He was certainly very good on stage two, which was taken out by Vincenzo Nibali with a two second advantage. When he just clipped off the front and snuck away from the other big favourites. German national champion riding towards the front, Andre Greipel. Yesterday collected his sixth career Tour de France stage victory. No doubt Greg Henderson, his key lead-out man, who unfortunately isn't here. He's had to go back to his home in Spain following his nasty fall the day prior. He would have taken some solace out of the victory for Andre Greipel. And Henderson is always full of praise for the attitude of Andre Greipel. Greipel never dropped his chin. This is Ted King now on the front for the Cannondale squad. One of the many riders who's a little bit battered and bruised. He was more battered and bruised after stage four of last year's Tour de France, where unfortunately he was outside the time delay and got eliminated. The white colours of Anthony de la Place. A few years ago when he made his debut in the Tour, back in 2011, he was the youngest rider in the race. This year, he's still eligible for the Best Young Rider classification. Just as Peter Sagan is. Peter Sagan happens to be leading that classification, but he doesn't wear the white jersey today. The Fort de Dumont. This was one of the most imposing armed areas in the Verdun region. At the Germans, they occupied it throughout a large part of the First World War and some 3,000 men lived within this fort throughout the First World War. Would have been fairly cramped, I would well imagine. And this is the National Necropolis, which is just off to the side. This was erected in 1923 by the military department and the engineering group in Mentz. They spent a long time, in fact, they spent some 10 years clearing mines around this area and they were also throughout that period were digging up some 500 or so corpse each month up until around about June 1929. There's some 16,142 tombs and within that main building itself where we have the Tower to the Dead which stands at some 46 metres high there's some 100 and 30,000 German and French soldiers who are remembered. And as we mentioned yesterday, throughout the First World War, three former winners of the Tour de France sadly passed away throughout the First World War. One of them, Octave Lepez, who was the winner of the Tour de France in 1910. He also won Paris-Roubaix three times. He was three-time French national champion. He won Paris-Brussels three times. He was fascinated with aviation, went to the war as a fighter pilot and was shot down in a battle with two German planes. Philippe Patin, who was the head of the French army at the time on his passing away, said that he was a bold soldier and a remarkable pilot. He was also a remarkable cyclist as a winner of the Tour de France. A lot has been made about the cobblestones on stage five in this year's race. Well, we saw on that stage a lot of crashes, but only one rider abandoned. Of course, that was Chris Froome. As Richie Port, who's now just coming up on the right-hand side of the screen, having a little bit of lunch, is now the replacement as the team leader at Sky. 
that's very civil of Richie Port. He's passing on some front for the Cannondale squad. And Ted looks as if he's enjoyed the moment. Still working on making the switch from Super Domestic to team leader Richie Port. Well, stage five across the pave, one rider abandoned, Chris Froome. Yesterday, no cobblestones at all. Just wet, windy and slippery roads. And we saw three riders abandon the race as a result of crashes. Xavier Zandio from Team Sky. Jesus Hernandez from Tinkoff Saxo. That's a big loss for Alberto Contador. On and off the bike. He's the guy who always shared the room with Alberto Contador. And Richie Porter used to be one of his teammates, full of praise of Jesus Hernandez. Igor Selin from the Katusha team was another rider who had to abandon the race yesterday after a fall. Incidentally, Igor Selin was a stage winner at the top of Arthur's seat in the Jacob Herald Sun Tour a few years ago when Nathan Huss was the winner of the race. So we're looking at the riders here now, 51 seconds is the gap, it started to reverse as the six riders come back into the sights. Uh, sad to report the loss of uh, Danny Van Poppel, the youngest rider in the race, is abandoned about uh, 15 minutes ago. And that leaves the British rider, uh, Simon Yates, in his first Tour de France now, the youngest man continuing towards Paris. Well, fingers crossed for him. Uh, he's uh, learning his apprenticeship here in the Tour de France. What a tough apprenticeship. And Martin Elmer, he seems to be uh, he's not very happy with the fact... I think no. we're getting some tired bodies. And They've lost interest. Well, it's not a question of lost interest. <laughs> I think there's some tired bodies there. And he, he let the gap go there, and he was shaking his head out of a little bit of frustration because when you see a slight split there, it's the responsibility of the guys behind to keep that group together. And Elminger, I think, realising that they haven't got the firepower. And when he sees the gap going down like that, I just think it's frustration of knowing they're going to get caught although this man has decided he wants to stay clear because now there's a little acceleration and that's coming from uh, Nicolas Ede now on the horizon there are uh, a couple of climbs starting to lo loom and uh, I think uh, that's what Nicolas Ede is thinking about as he jumps clear there this is the man who won the King of the Mountains competition in the Vuelta a España last year and he's got the gap there, and I don't think they're going to organise the chase behind him. Elminger's the, the rider on the front. And uh, just looking at the peloton there, you can see that they're, um, they're not really chasing currently. They're leaving all of that responsibility of the pacemaking to Team uh, Cannondale, the team of Peter Sagan. Well, Eddie, he's got a long way to go before he gets to the uh, the climbs if he's hoping to grab himself a couple of points. There are two points available, one at the top of the Côte de Maron and one at the Côte de Bouffer. But the Côte de Bouffer is right in the heart of Nancy. And I doubt if he's going to survive because by that point I would have expected the main field to have pulled back the remnants or the majority of the riders in this leading breakaway. But for this guy, it's a question of... Uh, he felt that the cooperation in that group was disappearing. Although having done that, he's actually spurred them on a bit and they're trying to pull him back into the main group. Well, 45 seconds, Paul. Ede, the Frenchman, is being brought back. Before he comes back, let me tell you, though, his father, Andre, and his brothers, David and Michael, have all ridden a bike as well. But not as well as him, I might add. <laughs> 48 seconds. The six are back together again. Nobody reacted there in the tour this year because you've got Ben King who rides for Garmin Sharp and Ted King who rides for uh, Team Cannondale and they're both from the United States uh, Ben King from uh, Richmond Virginia although he spends uh, the majority of his uh, cycling season uh, living in Lucca in Italy while Ted King he's from New Hampshire and uh, spends most of his cycling uh, season living in Girona in Spain they certainly are starting to prize open a gap uh, but I'm not sure that it's going to be enough of a gap for them to create the surprise this afternoon and steal the victory on a stage like this because I think again the main field are, are playing a game that there's no chase here this is a question of just riding along at a steady tempo and allowing the fish to run well
they're certainly throwing the gauntlet down having lulled at the peloton into thinking that any moment they can just pedal away up to the breakaway they've now got two riders who are now quite keen uh, to get on with the job in hand remember they broke away after eight kilometers today which would mean they would have to lead all the way for 196 kilometers if they are to win this stage they must be getting tired if it wasn't uh, Martin Elmager I would say they would be caught but Martin Elmager is a very strong very predictable bike rider and I think he has a chance well the other advantage Phil is that the man with him Wojcicki is a very good uh, individual time trialist he was second in the Polish national time trial championships a few years ago and that's an indication that he's got plenty of power and the two of them working together now I think has become a little bit of an inspiration when you're in a breakaway group and you've got a bunch of guys who are starting to weaken it it's not good for the morale but these two riders both know they've got good legs and they've got the power and that's why we've seen this time gap a grip slip curve sneak up yeah. to a minute and a half well hats off to them now we know that Elmer has been the time trial champion a uh, road race champion of his country four times now he's also uh, had the time trial uh, medals position he's never actually won the time trial championship but he's had silver medals he's a very good man against the clock as well so we've got two strong riders here uh, who can ride against the clock and it could be a very very interesting performance uh, by these two last boom the man who so brilliantly won the fifth day over the cobblestones now become the ticket collector in the Tour de France checking on everybody in front of him but again inspiration for team Cannondale and that's for Peter Sagan he sits at the back end of his ride you can see him he's uh, pretty bandaged up on his left hand side on his uh, elbow and on his leg but uh, team management saying uh, nothing to worry about really Peter had a very good night's sleep overnight and he's ready to come up and finish this off today but not only is he in good, for, uh, good shape physically he's also in good shape uh, mentally as well because seeing his teammates doing all of this pacemaking is really really going to buoy him we're looking here at the confluence I think of the Moselle and the Anglesan rivers because we're in Toul here and actually and the canal as well which is the canal uh, the Rhine I think it is it? well it's the linking of the Marne to the Rhine canal it's 314 kilometers in length and you'll be happy to know that there's 178 locks on this canal and it was opened oh. in 1853 yes but they have lock keepers you don't have to get out and do the job yourself Paul. Oh, and you can't do it between 12 and 2 because the lock keepers on his lunch hour oh, but that's so. that uh, holiday uh, lunch hours are very well protected in France the Tour de France going right by the canalized section here 35 kilometers to go Cannondale still leading the charge on the left and it could have been Omega was getting themselves involved at the front meanwhile at the back Andre Greipel has slipped to the rear of the field here not the place to be with the undulations which are coming up well though, just going back to that canal by the way uh, if you need to you can actually uh, be connected from here right the way up to the canal system uh, and the Seine which is in the Ile de France uh, the French have got a very good fr canal system they're uh, taking very many of their big barges uh, right the way down to the Mediterranean or across to the North Sea in the English Channel and so once you get into the Seine of course you get into the center of Paris and it's probably the cheapest way to see the city because you can park on the side of the canal anyway there's some very nice areas we're around the region of Toul now and this is the Le Port de France yeah, the Port de France uh, is on the Marne to Rhine Canal it's the uh, heart of the Vauban fortifications uh, Vauban a very well-known artist and look at that uh, yeah they've <laughs> they really have gone to town haven't they uh, they got jealous of the Yorkshire farmers spraying their sheep yellow so they've made their water yellow here in Toul Well, well, look, at the effort being put in now, Paul, uh, those two boys up front are beginning to hurt the peloton at 1.15 the gap. No, they certainly are. They're realising now that this is going to be a long, hard chase, but uh, you've got so many teams starting to muster. This is not a massive chase by the teams of uh, Alberto Contador or the Astana leader, Vincenzo Nibali, because, after all, Martin Elviger is quite a long way down in the overall standings, in excess of nine minutes at the start of the day. But as we look down on that fountain there, they've uh, filled it up with yellow dye in the heart of town. That really is uh, quite pretty, isn't it? As we look down, uh, this is the small town of Domartin Les Toules. And uh, everybody really getting into the magical spirit. Uh, this is uh, on the river Moselle, which is a river that flows through France, Luxembourg and Germany. It's a river that's 560 kilometers long. 
if we get a chance to see it as the main field goes past the yellow fountain. One minute 13, the gap has nudged out, it's reversed just slightly, we're coming into the last 20 miles or 33 kilometres of the day of racing. Urgency is required now by these boys as the slopes of the little hills towards the end approach. A reinvigoration of the chase there now coming along from uh, these riders. We're looking down there at the church of Santa Chen. Uh, originally they started building this church in 1221. It was completed finally in 1500 AD. And it's built on a former Romanesque uh, uh, site which was down there. But as you can see from the church we're looking at, the cathedral we're looking at here, very much the Gothic style. Absolutely beautiful it is as well one of the biggest in France by the way well it's mainly it's an indigenous forest that is all beech trees by the way and uh, lives in a limestone substore so that'll, that'll uh, encourage the growth of the beach as these two riders are still in the gunshot sites of the bunch right 25 kilometers 25 seconds that's one second per kilometer and the main field will have done that calculation quite quickly they know right now by turning up the screws they can pull it back rapidly 25 kilometers to go as the banner these riders have just gone under they're hoping to survive it's martin elmiger on the front the rider with him hudzarski is a very good individual time trialist but the gap is tumbling very shortly i think they'll have the company of the main field and as you can see there the uh, the referee on the bike there trying to make sure that the television the motorbike and everybody else gets out of this gap as they start to realize we're heading up to be nice and fast number 44 there is uh, Dmitry Grudzev rider from Team Astana there you get a chance to see uh, once again that is uh, the Moselle over to the right hand side and the forest we uh, were just talking about a few moments ago the forest of the A in fact, there was a huge amount of this uh, forest was destroyed by storms in 1999. There's the main field. They can't even see the river was Look at that acceleration come from Martin Elmer. Almost caught the motorbike unawares there. The gap's 23 seconds. That's around about 300 meters between the main field and these two leaders. The little flick of the wrist there was come forward. Bernie Eisel is the man on the front he's had to change his uh, allegiances around now no longer is he working out as the pilot fish for Chris Froome who's had to abandon after that very naxi series of crashes I'd have to say Vasily Kirienka is right behind him Richie Port is moving up into third place and uh, there's a rider from IAM Cycling also moving forward there now a man who would also be looking for the possibility of a last minute attack here would be the former French national champion Sylvain Chavanel Although he did say uh, last night, I saw him interviewed on uh, French television, he said that uh, he felt the, today was not the day for the breakaway to succeed. It was more likely to be tomorrow once we head down towards Gérard Mer and into the Vosges. Hey Paul, it's Orica Greenedge who are now getting control of the front here. And they uh, are looking to try and get Simon Gerrans the win. Simon Gerrans, the man who was knocked off his bike by Mark Cavendish on day one in Harrogate. He's just about recovered from those injuries now. And he said this morning, it could be a stage for me. Well, it's an ideal stage for a rider of his kind of ability because the two little climbs down towards the finish, I think, could put pay to the chances of the big sprinters like Marcel Kittel. We're now in the town of Maron. It's just around about 20 kilometres, 12 miles to go to the finish. It's an interesting little town just on the banks of the River Moselle. Uh, these two will keep riding like this. They'll hope that something happens in the main field to allow them to stay off the front end of the peloton. But you can see this is why you need to ride at the front. These guys have got to slow down so much before they accelerate to the front of the pack again. did just notice that uh, sliding back there was Bernie Eisel. He's done a lot of help to keep Richie Port at the front end of the main field. 20 kilometers to go for the main field and we're now starting to uh, line up for the Côte de Marron. It is a difficult little climb that the riders are facing up to now because it's a climb of uh, 3.2 kilometers. Around about 5% is the average gradient. That's quite a long climb. It's going to take them uh, probably about uh, seven or eight minutes to get to the top of the climb and everybody now starting to slip backwards. Uh, this is Alessandro Vanotti of Team Astana. 
job done for the day. Bernie Eisel also slipping away. He's worked very, very hard to keep Richie Port at the front end of the pack. And you now see that having done all the pace making, these guys are paying the price. Marcel Seberg, he was involved in a little accident yesterday. There's damage being done in the early kilometers of this penultimate climb of the day. There's Marcel Kittel, number 101. Obviously, his team management were uh, not telling lies this morning when they said they didn't feel that this was a stage for him, and that's why he is slipping away. Little handshake, thank you very much. Job done. We've uh, put a bit of pressure onto this race so people will know that we're in the event. We haven't ridden in the anonymity of the race here this afternoon, but it is now up to Orico Green Edge to set the tempo. 2.3 kilometers. Lots of riders now uh, struggling at the back end of the main field. Uh, Christophe Riblon. Now that's a bit of a surprise because he's a very experienced professional rider, Riblon. No stranger to uh, stages at the Tour de France. He won a stage in 2012. He won a stage in 2010. Slipping back, Portuguese national champion. Now, Thomas Vokler. That's the inimitable style of uh, the little man from Brittany. He's out on the attack on this climb. Well, we should have worked this one out, Paul. An attack by little Tommy Vaucler as he now tries to dance away from the field. Well, this is an ideal uh, terrain for Thomas Vaucler. We've seen him uh, sitting at the back end of the main field. He has waited for this opportunity. This is the penultimate climb of the day. It's a great launch pad for a man with a riding style of Thomas Vaucler. But I think it's a little bit too far to the finish. It's a good 25 minutes of effort if he wants to win the stage this afternoon. But, uh, you know, he waited for the right moment. He waited for the main field to get caught, and then he just went out on the attack. Might disturb the plans of those who are waiting for the next climb, which is the Côte de Boufflers, uh, as they run down. A tremendous attack by uh, uh, Thomas Vaucler. He won in this region uh, in Belgarde du Val Zarina, and he knows this area, and he's very popular because he's not far away from where he originally comes from. Well, actually, he was born in the Alsace region of France before moving across and growing up in yeah. the Martinique, which is one of the islands in the Caribbean. He then came back to mainland France and spent the uh, early part of his racing career in Brittany and became part of Jean-René Bernardo's team. Well, uh, André Greipel has found this one climb too far. That's a bit of a surprise. I thought he might have had the condition after yesterday to stay in contact, but it's all because of the pressure of the Australian team, Orica Greenedge. You could be right, they could be trying to set this up for their man, uh, their man who is uh, Simon Gerrans. Yeah. This is great for Simon Gerrans, but not on this climb. If Gerrans is going to make the move, Phil, he will wait for the next climb, which is closer to the finish. Which is where about half the field with intent are waiting, and this man's spoiling the problem. Arno uh, Damar here, I think he's at the back of the field. He had a couple of crashes yesterday. He's now losing contact. He lost contact towards the end yesterday as well. Uh, Marcel Kittle has gone so he's been dropped another sprinter out of the hunt today he's getting caught and it's the, the damage all being done by Orica Greenedge well he was hoping there'd be a little bit of a, a waiting uh, a little bit of a pause before they started to organize the chase behind but obviously the word was on the camp this morning Phil for Orica Greenedge uh, that Simon Gerrans is a little bit better after that nasty accident he had on day one so they have come immediately the, to the front to set the pace and Thomas Vokler is back in the fold. So they've been put, uh, put Vokler back in his place here. Now nobody's really interested in the one point available. This is a tactical race now over two small climbs before the finish in Nancy. The Welsh flag over there, that'll be flying high for Geraint Thomas. And sat at the back here is the American rider Danny Pate in Colorado Springs there who's on the Sky team. I'm just looking down the line of riders to see if I can spot the national champions jersey on the shoulder of Simon Gerrans but certainly it is the kind of uh, stage for him. And this is the tail of the field here now one by one that the riders are being tailed off here because the tempo being held on here by Orica Green Edge very intense of keeping this race going as they fight the way Marcel Seberg also up here Michael Albacini is right up there uh, that might be their him. choice too he's, he's, a, he's perfect for him ideal kind of finish for him he had a great race in the Tour of Romandy earlier on this year getting himself two stage victories Alberto Contador and his men are never far away and I also noticed moving up the yellow jersey of Vincenzo Nibali uh, so there's our running bottle there it's a long way to go to the top today as uh, these riders now being dropped off the back and there's a bit of work to be done for Peter Sagan at the moment as well. It's not going all according to plan. 
as they go over the top of the climb here swing here to the heritage site of uh, Stanislav Square uh, here in the middle of uh, Nancy and it's just a two-minute walk away from here where the Tour de France will end today yes it really is a beautiful backdrop uh, a magnificent uh, sound and, and lights that show went on there last night and yep. it was uh, quite spectacular as uh, the main field will be charging down here in a few moments time but there is a a, a really rough approach I think to the finishing line uh, in the Nancy see this afternoon because it really is quite tricky. Simon Yates is the rider from Orica Greenedge who's been doing an awful lot of the pacemaking on the oh, front end. Oh, right down, in the front. Right in the middle of the road and now one or two riders also involved here and again on a straight section of road the riders have crashed themselves and on the far right you see TJ Van Gorden is down at the moment on the far side of the road well, in fact, but that is TJ first down on the right in the red. Well he was at the front Phil and in fact the rider behind high road into his back wheel and got the uh, the rider from Movistar had his wheel locked onto the back end of TJ Van Garderen there he is on the right hand side teammates have stopped up alongside him to get him back well, into the race away. Oh. and he's already had an accident because his left knee is bandaged from a crash from yesterday well this is a serious part of the race it's always serious when you crash but with 15 kilometers to go now it's going to be very very hard to rejoin the race before the finish he's only got one teammate to drag him up at the moment it's his american friend peter stetner in his first tour they're getting it together might be looking for tj there's a number of riders here who seem to be up and riding as well well talk about bad luck there phil because that crash was right at the front end of the main field probably around about 25th position Moving forward now is Team Movistar. Now, another name to throw into the mix with that little climb on the running towards the finish is Alejandro Valverde. Valverde is well up in the overall standings. He's 10th at the start of the day, but so close to the finish at 15 kilometers to go, that's a less than 10 miles of racing. It's going to be a long, hard ride for TJ Van Garden, who's 11th overall at the start of the day, 10 minute, 2 minutes and 11 seconds back. Well, he's certainly leaving some uh, road rays uh, down there in the route of the Tour de France this year, TJ Van Garden, but he, he looks as though he's determined enough to try and race back into this. There's the face of TJ Van Garden. Desperate moments with 14 kilometres to go. Yes, uh, but he's not panicking. He's got another teammate up alongside him now because the word has gone out. That's the Frenchman, Armel Moinard, who's come back as well for BMC Racing. They've got to really scramble at a moment like this. So Gregory Rast is the big, strong rider from Trek Factory Racing. He won't race uh, to help these guys. He'll leave it up to BMC to do their own pacemaking. Tony Martin comes to the front for Omega Pharma Quick Step. Now, I wonder if that's going to be for their rider, the Pole uh, Kwiatkowski, who was right up there yesterday. All of a sudden, I thought he was going to be the surprise winner of the stage until he got pulled back a little bit closer to the finish. Now, this is how close to the front it was here. Now, look what happened there. The rider from uh, Movistar got himself locked right onto the back wheel. I think it was uh, Jose Joaquim Rojas who was locked onto the back wheel of TJ Van Garder in there. Anyway, uh, that's uh, part of racing. It wasn't done intentionally. It's just one of those things that can happen uh, with the excitement and the nervousness of getting close to the finish. 13 kilometers to go. Tinkoff, Saxo, Banks are on the front now. This is to just not to try and win the stage for them this afternoon. It's just to make sure that the man in third position there, Alberto Contador, does not get involved in an accident like that. You can lose seconds here and there because of crashes on the running down towards the finish uh, just at the back there 131 that's the leader of Lotto and that is Jürgen Vandenbroek well we've gone under the 15 kilometers to go banner we're now at 13 kilometers to go and uh, we've uh, got the Michael Rogers on the front now for uh, Tinkoff Saxo they're driving on now the teammates have got themselves together and they're going to try and drag TJ back in he's up for the fight well he is he's got Armel Moinard the Frenchman Michael Shaw the Swiss rider is right up there and of course his uh, countryman Peter Stedner they're all pacing him it's going to be a very hard chase they'll have to take some dramatic risks going around one or two of these corners but yet there's one more climb before we get down to the finish line there's Sylvain Chavanel popping up on the right hand side watch out for him Another Phil when we get to the next uh, climb because uh, that's the kind of place where he would like to make a move 51
means he'll get onto the tail of the convoy in about 30 seconds and once on the tail of the cars then he might get through but Paul we've got the next climb coming up with only five kilometers to go so we are approximately only about five kilometers less four kilometers to the last climb of the day well that's the tough thing Phil he's going to chase really hard for a good five or six kilometers to make the contact at the foot of that climb and you're going into oxygen debt a little bit then all of a sudden you've got to push yourself even more Vincenzo Nibali there in Phil in the yellow jersey is looking like a man who's very calm and very happy to be in the position that he's in there is uh, the former French national champion in that sort of fluorescent -y orange peach colored bike there and that of course is Sylvain Chavanel he's the uh, the man looking for a move towards the end there's the world champion uh, Rui Costa in about six or seven position in the white jersey with those bands all around the middle there it is, uh, 10 kilometers to go, and everybody's scrambling for whatever they can grab here because this is a race which is definitely going to split. TJ Van Gorden has been timed at around 50 seconds behind. He's the most important member in the crash involved, but he has lost a teammate in Darwin Atapuma in his first Tour de France because the Colombian rider is out of the race. Well, this is why Team Sky came to the front just before that climb. That's Geraint Thomas on the front there, looking over his shoulder in second position. Is Richie Port. They're not thinking of winning the stage here this afternoon. They just want to keep safe. They want to keep away from silly little accidents like that one that has happened to TJ Van Garden. He's got his teammates. They've rallied around him. He's got three teammates right up there to try and pace him back into this race. This is going to be a team time trial now for them. Big moments. There's the tail of the convoy now. Huge effort required and then they can take breathers in the cars. They race back up to the main field. They've got to get on before this last little climb which is uh, actually only short but pretty steep and we're looking at that coming at five kilometers the top of it coming at five kilometers from the finish Jens Voigt coming into the middle of that uh, peloton there uh, keeping himself uh, out of danger they're not far now Phil away from the start of this final climb of the day it's 1.3 kilometers long but more importantly the summit is five and a half kilometers from the finish line it's going to be a mad dash down the descent into Nancy Michael Rogers on the left of our picture from Canberra, but he rides for this Danish Tinkoff Saxo team and in the in the serving of Alberto Contador and he's driving the pace at the front. We're well, just about two kilometers from the start of the climb as Jens Voigt, this incredible man at 42 now, trying to do the best for his team at the front of the race. Scrambling at the back, everybody's just trying to see whether or not they can stay in contention. Marco Marcato is the Italian rider from uh, Cannondale over to the right hand side. I can't see Peter Sagan, but cannot believe Phil that he is not there somewhere close to the front end of this main field as big old Jens comes around oh, the corner at 42 years of age. You cannot miss take that so well that was a bit uh, shaky coming around the corner there but the speed is high we're going through town in excess of 55 there is Peter Sagan not too far away and he's still got a couple of teammates up towards the front end of this main field well this is an incredible piece of riding by Jens here as we're now seeing the riders come through Peter Sagan is on the left of our picture in the green jersey he's got himself towards the front now we're in the convoy here as uh, so we passed David Lopez there from Sky, this is TJ Van Garderen in the safety of the convoy. Now he's got to get back on. He's got to use the cars uh, one at a time. Now the referees won't punish him as long as he no, keeps no. leapfrogging the cars one by one and not staying behind and slipstreaming behind them. This is Michael Shaw, the big strong rider from Switzerland who leads them around that corner. He's around about 49 seconds. That's from the front end of the race though, Phil. He's probably only about 20 seconds from the tail end of the group. The pressure is really on there, you can see uh, the yellow jersey, Vincenzo Nibali, he's quite happy, he's been riding right at the front end on a regular basis. The gap now is down to 48 seconds for uh, TJ Van Garder and we're now on the final climb of the day, 2 of 2. It's only 0.8 of a mile long, 1.3 kilometres, the average gradient is 8%, but more importantly there's 5.5 kilometres to go to the finish from the top. Well, this is uh, going to finish off a lot of the back of the peloton and it looks like we've got another attack now, but this isn't, uh, this doesn't look to me, this could be Cyril Guimard who's putting in a little bit of a move. And in fact, as he breaks away to me, this rider going clear is uh, Johan, is, uh, it is Cyril Gautier who's gone. The little man who is now trying to do what his teammate Voigtler did on the previous climb. 
Well, this is the tactic of Team Europe car, and you can see the responses coming behind. I would think Peter Sagan is hiding in that group there now, trying to find a little bit of shelter. He wants to go over the top of this climb in 10th or 15th. The uh, yellow jersey and Alberto Contador are nailing this back themselves, and it really is quite remarkable. Looks like Nicholas Roach on the front there, really digging deep. They realise how important it is. It is Nicholas Roach, a Contador in third or fourth position. The yellow jersey is very present. I'm looking to see if Peter Sagan just rolls over this top of this climb in contact if he does he's going to be a tough man to beat when it comes down to the finish 0.6 of a kilometre to go to the top well riders like Sagan are going to just pray they can hold on to this because this is a serious attack Nicholas Roach on the left here he's got a plan here for his team leader Alberto Contador the great climber doesn't look as though at all stressed at the moment Nibali has got onto the shoulder now these are the two joint favours to win the Tour de France going side by side who's going to spoil the party Alejandro Valverde is moving up a little bit further back uh, Fabian Cancellara is in the convoy of cars as well now trying to keep himself in contact uh, the race is on at the front but there's drama at the back for TJ Van Garderen who's trying to save his position in the overall standings he was 11th at the start of the day two minutes and 11 seconds down Peter Sagan well, the only way to defend sometimes, Phil, is to go to the front and show everybody that you've got a good pair of legs this afternoon and what better way to do that than to dominate the pace. Watch out for Greg Van Avermaet because a Team BMC may well have a man off the back end of the race here this afternoon, but they're looking for the victory on the stage. Is he going to convert what will be seen as a bad day for Team BMC today into victory at the end of it? Because the Belgian rider here, he goes over the top in first place, but he's got the man to mostly fear. Peter Sagan is now working with him. This could be it. 5.4 kilometers to go, a little more than three miles. Peter Sagan has got himself exactly where he wanted himself to be. And there's a counter move coming from the field here. Yeah, but who's going to chase him, Phil? At the end of the day, bear in mind that's Talansky coming to the front. Talansky has made the move. Peter Sagan is in third place overall. He's looking for 44 seconds. He's in a little bit of a quandary here. What do I do? Do I race to win the stage or do I race to try and get myself the yellow jersey at the end of the day? Well, he's got to assess, he's got to get 45 seconds uh, to take the yellow jersey. Uh, a jersey which uh, he's never worn in the Tour de France. He's won the green jersey twice. Now he's got himself clear and he's taking Greg Van Avermaet, which is uh, the name on a lot of people's lips this morning as a possible winner. We've seen a great move though by Andrew Talansky, which is showing us this man's going into the second week of the Tour de France doing well now this is TJ Van Garderen here still amongst the cars which are well spread out because so many riders have been dropped off the field so that's going to make his chase back that much harder well this is a rather a strange situation you might think for Team BMC but at the start of the day Greg Van Avermaet uh, who is a very good guy to win individual stages has probably put this stage down as one of the ones that he wanted to win which is why you've got a BMC rider off the front of the race trying to win an individual stage and sadly for TJ Van Garderen who was involved in an accident trying to stay in contact with the race his problem for TJ Van Garden Phil is there's lots of riders getting dropped and it seems as if he's in fact left a lot of his teammates behind now as he works his way through the convoy of cars well the trouble is he's hampered there's so many riders behind the race now he's not actually near the heart of the peloton which is right in our camera lens this is the advanced group of the Tour de France now and these two riders trying to slip it away inside 3.5 kilometers to go now Sagan and Van Avermaet this could be a very interesting sprint because Van Avermaet is a very fast finisher in the red well he certainly is they must work together at 54 kilometers now that's about 33 miles an hour the average speed but the question question is who's going to organize the chase behind them what well, are the big leaders who've got themselves safely over the top of the climb concerned about Peter Sagan I heard this morning Alexander Vinokurov said we don't care now we've defended through the first week of the race if we lose the overall lead it doesn't matter because Vincenzo Nibali is better than everybody else of the overall contenders three kilometers to go that's about three and a half minutes because we go downhill to this finishing line we've got a few nasty corners the corners don't stop until 900 meters from the finish we have a very very nasty very sharp 90 degree bend to line us up for the finish two and a half kilometers they are eating up this road you've got to take your hat off to a man like Peter Sagenfield because he could just sit in the main field and think about the sprint he's looking to read the number plate off the back of the motor 
motorbike here. He's gone round that corner. Every little bit counts here. And bear in mind, it's the responsibility of the motorbike rider to get away from the race. And Peter Sagan just getting a little bit of a pull there from the slipstream from this motorbike. He will have a great ally here because Greg Van Avermaet will think all of the time, I've got a chance here of at least minimum second place. They just went under the banner, two kilometres to go. The race is almost done. They're going through a kilometre in a minute here at the moment, and they're being chased down slowly but surely, I think, by Michael Albacini on the front there for Greg, uh, for Orica Greenedge, but they haven't caught them. And but Greg Van Avermaet and Sagan is going to go back, I think. Well, Sagan has just realised we're not going to survive here. We're not going to stay off the front end of the main field, so he was just trying to get a bit of the lactic acid out of his legs. He won't allow Greg Van Avermaet to ride away from him, but he doesn't want to contribute to the success of this breakaway anymore he's, he's gambling on getting caught he needs to hold something back in reserve they haven't yet nailed them back the next thing they're going to see is the flam rouge the red kite 1,000 meters to go it's Astana who are doing the pacemaking but look at the job of work there by team BMC there's a rider from BMC in second position he's trying to back them off and slow them down around these corners but it's about to be caught they're approaching the one kilometre marker and then the last challenge of the day is the 90 degree turn just after the marker into the straight which is a beautiful sprinter's delight as there's the marker and now they make the right turn this is where they all fell off in 2005 they're safely round now it's a straight line home hello that's Richie Port there's, there's another crash. crash there's a massive pile up that's in the centre of the pack exactly the same place almost as it happened uh, back in 2005 that was Richie Port I'm trying to see who was involved in that crash you can see a rider gone down from Astana. The front end of the race, though, now are starting to think about uh, getting themselves uh, the victory of the stage here. Sagan is up into fourth position. Well, He's Kangalert was the rider down there, Paul, in that crash. They'll all get the same time. They're inside the vital one kilometre to go. They're not worried about losing time now. Uh, but as they line up now, is uh, Kwiatkowski going to finish this off? Or is he going to be a rider from Orica Greenhead? Sagan has recovered his fourth wheel. It's a sprint his delight this well Sagan is up into third place he's in a very good position to try and get it but it's being really led out by giant Shimano oh and there's another crash and this time it down is Talansky on the road as well and there's a Sagan breaks for the finish and he's I think he's pipped on the line because we've got an Omega rider we're waiting for the result there well, that was a real lunge for the line there, as we saw Peter Sagan was trying to come back, but it was the rider from Omega Pharma Quickstep, I think, was across the line. Talansky looks like he went down quite hard. He did, and uh, let's hope he's OK. He'll get the same time, which is important when you're racing for the overall. This is indeed is uh, as they cross the finishing line there. It looks to me, Paul, the winner. I think it was Matteo Trontan, the I one of the lead-out men. It is, it is, it is it, it's right close on the line, but it is going to the photo. It is uh, between Sagan and Matteo Trontan. And one thing's for sure, another increase in the overall green jersey competition for Peter Sagan, and it won't be yellow. There's TJ Van Garderen in this Look at the clock as TJ comes home. This is the time he loses today because of that crash. Chalansky on the right, walking home, but he'll get the same time as the winner. Oh dear me, this is unfortunate for TJ Van Garderen as well. He'll come home a minute behind as the photo finished there. Uh, 43 seconds possibly on the line, but we'll wait. There's the crash there, right on the back wheel of Simon Gerrans as Talansky goes out to the right of the road. I'll tell you what, Phil, uh, we're going to have to wait for the photo because I'm looking at the finish line transponder, which a few moments ago said Trentin in first place. It's now saying Peter Sagan, so we really will have to wait for the judges to have a very close look. Uh, oh, wow. Trentin, Trentin thinks Trentin that Sagan has got Sagan. Have a look at it from uh, the helicopter again. Look at the speed that Peter Sagan is coming back from. And I mean, it. I, well, I, you can't, you can't it. tell it. We'll rely on the judges for the first time. There is Andrew Talansky. He took a real heavy fall there as he comes home here it was it would have been another terrific day out but he still gets the same time just let's hope that he's not uh, injured too much in that fall at least he's now crossed the finishing line on the far right is the Orica Green right Green Edge rider Simon Gerrans in the white Talansky fell behind him that disrupted the sprint of Simon Gerrans big giant Shimano rider by the way as uh, Tom Dumoulin Simon Gerrans uh, your ch your man was up there as well uh, there and thereabouts but that is very very I close I, they may give a dead heat there very rare for that to happen it is. Uh, is a, a very rare occasion 
Well, they've given it to uh, Matteo Trentin of Italy and also to Omega Farmer Quickstep. And Peter Sagan finishes second by the skin on his racing short, I imagine. Yeah, Sagan came up uh, very, very quickly down towards the end, uh, but in the photo finish, it was always uh, Trentin who was leading up towards the line there. And, uh, and this is, uh, as it says at the top there, it is a provisoire, which is provisional until the actual lead look at a photo finish from the side on shot. Oh, you can see there, it's definitely the man on the inside, uh, Matteo Trentin. He has got himself the victory. He didn't realise it because he was, in fact, almost congratulating Peter Sagan. Sagan uh, will finish second there for a couple of centimetres. Just look at it. You can see the acceleration as he comes up along the outside there. I wonder if that little last-minute breakaway took away from his last explosion. Trentin, by the way, is a man who, in the past, has always been a lead-out man for, for guys like Mark Cavendish. Sagan, well, he's not short. Uh, but uh, it, it's pretty certain there from the photo finish from the side. And I, I'd like to see uh, Matteo Trentin's face when uh, he realises he's there he is. Now he knows, he realises now that he's got the victory. Matteo Trentin uh, will get that victory. And that uh, a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of revenge as we look. There's no change really in the overall standings. Uh, Fulsang is still uh, looking for two seconds. Sagan in third as he was at the start of the day at 44 seconds. Kwiatkowski of Poland in fourth place uh, looking for 40, 50 seconds. And uh, that was uh, an amazing la uh, sprint there again. A, a dramatic running down towards the finish. Today the tour makes its first voyage into the mountains, the Vosges Mountains. Hello and welcome to stage eight of the Tour de France. By the end of today we'll know a little bit more about the form of the race favourite. So we've done our journey around England, we're now moving across to the east of France. We're going to what the French often call their third mountain chain behind the Pyrenees and the Alps. The first 30 or 40 kilometres are okay, then it gets a little bit rough as we head into Jarame and it's a hilltop finish. We've only been here once before. Peter Weening the winner on that occasion. Yes, but on that occasion the finish was actually in Gerard made down in the bottom of the climb, so this is a little bit different, although the Tour de l'Avenir has finished at the top of this climb on two occasions. Little look at the starts as the clock counts them down from Tom Blaine, which is just across the Moselle River, uh, from Nancy, where we finished, it's a suburb of Nancy. As the riders move away, and one non-starter in the crashes yesterday, Matthias Frank, uh, the Swiss rider on... Uh, uh, on the team that was uh, also dominating I am cycling yesterday uh, found to have broken his femur he crashed but got up and crossed the finishing line but out now 185 riders taking the start yeah, it's not the only broken leg on yesterday's stage either. The uh, the rider for a BMC, a teammate of TJ Van Garderen, Darwin Atapuma, he also crashed and ended up with a broken leg. So tough crashes for many of these riders. This is what the uh, start looked like. Uh, they went through kilometre zero. The attacks didn't come immediately from the start today because everyone was just uh, a little bit nervous. But uh, once they'd done five or 600 metres, they uh, saw a move clear off the front. And this is the two riders who managed to get clear as we go back to these live pictures in second position. Nicky Terpstra, winner this year of Paris-Roubaix, and the ever-aggressive Sylvain Chavanel. Yes, these two not getting away until the race had covered 28 flying kilometres. Uh, so much so, they're running 10 minutes ahead of the fastest expected time of arrival. And although the sky is very nice and white and fluffy clouds here, I can tell you on top of the finishing line, it is raining quite heavily. So once they get into the Vosges Mountains, they could be in for some very, very slippery roads. It's over roads like this in the past that, in fact, the man in first position there on that rather interesting colour on his bicycle, Sylvain Chavanel, has laid down foundations for stage victories and for his conquest of the yellow jersey. I think this year he's just a little bit too far down in the overall standings, but uh, individual glory is what he's looking for. Youngest man in the race just come into our picture there, Simon Yates, uh, picked up by Orica Green Edge. And uh, after the abandon yesterday of uh, Danny Van Poppel, Yates is now the youngest man. He's in his first tour as well and uh, trying to get across to reach those two front runners. 
Yes, all these guys a long way down in the overall standings, Phil. Uh, the two leaders at 26 and 27 minutes down for them. In the group behind it, Yates and Kadri trying to get across. Uh, Simon Yates is looking at 29 minutes and Blil Kadri 49 minutes. So they could be given a little bit of freedom, although the uh, leading two at the moment are only about half a minute ahead of the main field. Might be seeing quite a development here because there's going to be two definite races today. There's going to be the boys, the opportunists, who think they can climb through the rather steep little climbs before the finish. Uh, we believe that the riders who want to win in Paris in just two weeks' time uh, will definitely have to come out on the attack today. We expect Contador to try and attack a Nibali, for example. Yes, although everyone talks about the final climb of the day, it's pretty difficult to get there. There are two nasty second category climbs. And talking to Rolf Sorensen, the former professional cyclist from Denmark, he was saying that the penultimate climb of the day, the Col de Grosse Pierre, although it's only got an average gradient of 7.5%, uh, there are a couple of portions around about 25%, and that'll have a few of the lads gasping for breath. Well, the sun out here, anyway, as we've uh, gone some 35 kilometres into the day of 160. And they're picking up a nice uh, tailwind just now, and that's resulted in some very good attacking rider riding from the gun. Now, we've got the three riders here trying to get across. The one Cofferdis rider here has just joined up uh, with the uh, Blel Kadri at the front and Simon Yates at the back. The Cofferdis rider looks as though it might be uh, Daniel Navarro. If it isn't Daniel Navarro, then it is in fact uh, Adrian Petit. Not too sure whether that's it's Adrian Petit. Okay. He yeah, came across the gap. They've seen the fact that in the main field behind, uh, they've actually cut off the chase. They've seen that the riders are not really dangerous at all. They're a long way down in the overall standing. So they've said, well, you can have a little freedom in the early part of the race because we know how difficult the final 40 kilometres of today's stage is going to be. And that's why all of a sudden, when you look at the time gap, it's very, very quickly feels stretched up to one and a quarter minutes. Well, I'll tell you what, it, yes, you, you're right, Paul, these boys are not in any way affecting the race lead. The best placed of them is Sylvain Chavanel, and he's 26 minutes behind. Uh, people like Petit are already 61 minutes behind, so they're not going to chase these too hard, but riders like Sylvain Chavanel, they're looking for the chance here because they lost their team leader with that broken femur yesterday, and that is Matthias Frank. So they had a big meeting last night, I am citing. They are wild car selection for the race. They want to impress the organisers, so they come back. And they decided to go for stage wind. And using Chavanel, they have a real chance. This guy's a real opportunist. Yeah, he's also a former multiple national champion of France. He likes this kind of terrain. He's not the kind of guy who can survive in the big mountains. But in these uh, average mountains, as the French like to call them, although we are sitting here almost on a 1,000 metres, just inside of a 1,000 metres of altitude, this terrain is the kind of the terrain that suits a tough man like Sylvain Chavanel. Right, well, we get into the climbs, uh, three successive climbs coming just before the finish, finishing on top of the last one. It's the middle climb, which is uh, like a wall, actually. It is 16%, very, very steep, and is going to split the field up, I think. Which is a four-hectare park, by the way, to botanical garden, botanic garden as well. There's a nursery here with 550 different variety of roses. Uh, all paying their respects to the men lost in that first world war. There are not too many hills on the horizon there yet, but believe me, they're, <laughs> they're going to get bigger as the time of the day passes. They've slowed down a little bit up front. We're now only uh, running eight minutes ahead of the fastest arrival time, uh, but the peloton are going even slower, which is good news for the break of five. Yeah, the important thing to remember, Phil, is uh, how to use your energy in a bike race like this, and you don't want to uh, use a lot of energy to chase down a breakaway that is not really that dangerous and not really that important. And it's no uh, no word uh, meant to be derogatory against Sylvain Chavanel, Nicky Terpstra, and Simon Yates, who are in this leading group of five riders, but they are no threat currently to the overall lead of Vincenzo Nibali. And in this year's Tour de France, I don't see any one of these riders being a real threat to the overall standings, although in a couple of years to come. Number 189 at the back there, Simon Yates, he could be a contender for a high finish overall, but here for me, this Tour de France, his first one is a Tour de France of apprenticeship. He's learning his trade. Just passing through here, the town of Rombovier. 
A nice uh, crowd there. Meanwhile, still to approach that town. The wind beginning to rock the old tenting on the left as it's getting across the race. And for those of you that follow the Tour de France with us on a daily basis, you know what those crosswinds can do to the peloton. After eight days of racing, there's riders obviously very sore. Virtually the whole field at some stage or other has fallen in this opening eight days. And also there's a lot of tired legs developing out there, as we will see when this peloton is sure to splinter over the last uh, kilometres of the day's stage. Yeah, funnily enough. Had the 11-minute marker hit just yet. And the Astana here, no interest whatsoever for that breakaway. In fact, they're rather pleased it's happened, I think. They haven't got a chase. Well, it's a good status quo for them, because as we've said a couple of times, uh, the best place rider is Sylvain Chavanel at 26 minutes. Uh, the next place rider after that is Turkstra, then Simon Yates at 29 minutes, almost 30 minutes behind in the overall standing. So for them, it's a, it's a sensible ride. They don't want to chase like mad at this point. They want to see if anybody of the other teams thinks they can win a stage this afternoon and comes forward to help them in the uh, pacemaking. So as the five men up front inch closer to the sprint, which will uh, really not be a sprint at all because they're not featuring in that green jersey competition, is a little matter of 1,500 euros for the first man over the line, of course, as uh, the peloton now, 10 kilometres to go, and the front runners are actually six kilometres ahead of the peloton at the moment. So nearly four miles in front for those breakaway five. Right, so 63 kilometres, about an hour and a half to go. The five-man breakaway group, which formed uh, originally from Sylvain Chavanel jumping clear with Nicky Terpstra, the Dutchman, formerly Dutch national champion. They were eventually joined by three chasers, Blel Kadri of France, Adrien Petit of France as well, and Simon Yates of the United Kingdom. He rides for the Australian squad, Orica Greenedge. That created a five-man leading group and since then they've continued to amass a large advantage over the main field this is the first time where uh, since the start really we've seen a day when the breakaway uh, looks like it would have the possibility of a survival and that is because uh, none of those riders are at all dangerous in the overall standing so i think we've got a little bit of a time out it just depends uh, on whether later or not some of the other teams feel that they want to try and vie for the stage victory but with no time bonuses available there's no real incentive to chase down that, that breaking that leading group uh, bearing in mind that tomorrow we've got a very difficult stage on the road down to Mulhouse followed by another mountain top finish on Monday on the French uh, Bastille Day July the 14th I wonder if uh, young Simon Yates the youngest man in the race number 189 the British rider from Lancashire our red rose indeed will go for the sprint and I think the answer is no he's a little overawed possibly by the experience of the other riders but then they might take a dim view if he nipped out and stole the cash and so they haven't even contested it they just continued on with the pace Nicky Turfser just for the record went through in first place but it's the next sprint that would there will be a sprint for sure uh, Peter Sagan is using this early days of the Tour de France if we start the second week uh, into Paris uh, to snatch a lot of uh, points in this event he leads Brian Cock, Brian Cocco by 113 Marcel Kittel by 122 and Alexander Kristoff by 142 points that's a big lead in the opening week of the tour and he's won that green jersey also the last two years there's the official result of in quotations the sprint Yes, so the well, we're looking now as we go under the banner there we're approaching the sprint here for the peloton and we're going to get one because we can see the teams are bringing up Peter Sagan we can also see that Brian Cocker and on the far right peeping in Andre Greipel who is six in the competition in that white jersey he's come from the back to the front now the dark jersey dead center of our picture the rider behind him and you can only just see him as uh, we look at the helicopter the second dark jersey that is Brian Cocker and he is a very very fast sprinter and Peter Sagan has gone alongside him and passed him 
to try and get on Greipel's back wheel in white. Well, he saw the little bit of a lead out coming from the rider in red. Now, that is the rider from uh, Lotto Belisola, the French uh, challenger on the right hand side in the darker green jersey. That is Cocard, but look at this straight onto the wheel of Peter Sagan. I wonder if he's got uh, so far, Cocard seems to have had the fastest sprint at these intermediate sprint points. I think he's a pure sprinter in his first tour, and now Marcel Kittel on the left also flexing his legs. Ryan Cocard, Marcel Kittel, Peter Sagan, Andre Greipel, the order over the line. Yeah, let's have a look at once again there. He really has got incredible speed, uh, Brian Cocker. Bear in mind, he's a slightly younger rider. But also, Phil, uh, oh, look at this cheeky little move on the right-hand side from Marcel Kittel. The rider who was fastest at this point, by the way, was a silver medalist at the Olympic Games in 2012 in the discipline that I know you find rather confusing, and I do myself, called the Omnium, which is a variety of, of events. But you have to be a good sprinter to get up there in that competition on the track, on the velodrome. Yeah, the best of six races on the track. Most confusing event for anybody that understands cyclists, never mind viewers who don't. Anyway, that's something else as we watch here. The riders out on the road. As now, Rion Coco and the other sprinter, Marcel Kittel, on the left. He's won three times in the opening week of the Tour de France. Now regrouping with the Tour de France and the gap around about 10 minutes and 40 seconds. So I've, I've come up with lots of facts today, Phil, as we get confirmation well. there. Renshaw was in 10th, uh, but also you've got to go back to 1997 when two Italians have won a stage of the first of the Tour de France in the first seven days. And that was, of course, Mario Cipollini and Nicola Minali. Jackpot time. They've just announced the race has gone through with an advantage of 11 minutes now, 11.08. Uh, with 50 kilometers to ride it's getting to the point where they can't be caught but the, these hills are very very short but very very steep ahead of the race and the other element of rain has now entered the situation here yes well this is very much similar to the day when uh, Sylvain Chavanel won his stage on the road up to the Station de Russe and uh, in fact on that occasion he took himself the overall lead as well and uh, after the loss of their man yesterday because it was a tough day for a number of teams yesterday day tough for team BMC racing who saw their leader TJ van Garderen lose over a minute because of an accident on the run towards the finish but they also saw the abandon of uh, Darwin at Puma because of a broken leg so IAM Cycling lost uh, their man, uh, their leader, Matthias Frank, as well with a broken femur. He actually finished the race and was taken to hospital, and that's when they found out that he had the broken femur. So they sat down last night and said, well, what are we going to do in the Tour de France this year? We'll have to change our goals and change our strategy and our tactics. So we'll look for breakaways. We'll look for individual victories if we can, and that's why Sylvain Chavanel has gone out on the attack on a day that I feel uh, really suits his riding style and temperament. But... Is he going to beat Simon Yates to the top of the final climb of the day? Yates is a very explosive athlete, both he and his brother, two great stars for the future for British cycling. And uh, see how they perform later on in their career. For Simon, he's got a chance to serve a very serious apprenticeship. That's Simon Yates uh, just sitting on the front there in the white jersey with the green and gold bands of Australia. That's because it's an Australian team finished third in the National Row Racing Championships and got picked up to be a member of Orica Green Edge. Those roads are wet, they're not in torrential rain, the breakaway at the moment, it's still raining fairly heavily at the finish. A little bit of a problem here for Blel Kadri, he wants his team car, I don't think he's got a flat tyre, maybe a drink. He's just uh, starting the climb here. We have just started on the climb here, the first climb of the Vosges, the Col de la Croix des Moines. And young Simon Yates, the youngest rider in the race, 189, who got five days' notice. He was in the team for the Tour de France for Orica Green Edge, has now got the chance of his life here to show us just what a good climber he is. Yes, well, to me, this is the first big rendezvous of the Tour de France. Uh, a little hors d'oeuvre, if you like, of the, the next two days of racing to come right in the heart of the Vosges. They're difficult, ra difficult racing terrain as well, I'd have to say, because these roads are tiny countryside roads with uh, sometimes very rough surfaces, which are not smooth surfaces that tend to make the road just that little bit more difficult to race over.
7.6 kilometers now to the summit of this first uh, second category climb of the day there's another one to follow which is even steeper Blel Kadri there he's got the most to gain initially here because there's five points three two and one points first four riders over the top and uh, if he got any one of those points he would be the leader of the king of the mountains uh, tonight Yes, and bear in mind, Blel Kadri, Phil, was aware of the King of the Mountains leader's jersey in last year's Tour de France, only for a single day on that occasion, but certainly that would be one of his goals. You can almost see, though, the difference in the speed between that leading group of five riders who've led this race since the first hour of racing and the main field. These guys are charging along the valley at speeds pretty close to 28, 29 miles an hour, and it's all because lots of the teammates and the team helpers are pushing the pace for their team leaders now this is Johan van Summeren on the front in the with the blue helmet and the white sunglasses a former winner of Paris-Roubaix but a great domestic a great team helper while at the back of the group you can see these guys they're just struggling they're holding on to stay in contact with the main field just waiting for the climb to start third place rider there uh, in that group there was uh, Andrew Talansky he had a very difficult start of the day by the way the American rider Talansky who's in eighth place overall now there's the move, that's the one we expected to come from, Sylvain Chavanel, very experienced, he used this moment as soon as they hit the climb, he didn't want to take any passengers with him on this climb at all, but Lel Kadri has seen, he knows that the French uh, former national champion, current national time trial champion, was the man to follow, was the wheel to get on the board of, and now he's realising he's got to get to the wheel of Sylvain Chavanel. The other riders are in a spot of difficulty there, uh, Simon Yates are trying to nail it, Back. he knows that this is important here but this is a long climb and Sylvain Chavanel has hit them very very hard from the first kilometer his former teammate there coming up alongside now uh, there you can see wearing number 78 that's Nicky Terpstrup he's a man from the flatlands he's from Holland uh, not used to these uh, massive long inclines but he's a seasoned professional turned professional low uh, way back in 2003 Lel Kadri is thinking about catching up with Sylvain Chavanel. Chavanel, I think, is on fire today. I watched him on TV the other night on uh, one of the television stations saying today is a good day. Well, for Sylvain Chavanel, nothing is new to this man. He's worn every leader's jersey in the Tour de France. He's a lone expert. He's won stages in the Tour de France. And when he puts in a move, he's thought it through. Well, he has. And let's not forget, he's an unbelievable individual time trial. He's used to producing a solo effort. He knows that Blel Kadri is a very good climber, the climber who's coming across behind him, and he's caught these riders out. As soon as this race hit the first incline fill of today's stage, Sylvain Chavanel hit that group very very hard and he's now opening up a rather serious gap over the three men who've been left trailing yellow dream of Peter Sagan has disappeared this afternoon he's in survival mode they have ripped onto this mountain Paul the peloton has imploded as we anticipated gone is the sprinters Andrew Greipel Marcel Kittel Peter Sagan the pressure has been put on by the team of Alberto Contador. He wants a little bit of his time losses back tonight. Well, every day is a good opportunity when you're trying to win the Tour de France overall. Every day you can chip away at garnering a 10 seconds here or 15 seconds there is extremely important. These are the two leaders on the road currently. Blel Kadri is a rider in first position of France. He's a very good climber. The man sitting just behind him was Sylvain Chavanel. The French crowd are in enjoying this this afternoon because the French are looking for a big victory. Sylvain Chavanel is an extremely experienced professional rider. He's been professional since the year 2000. He's participating in his 14th Tour de France and it was in weather conditions just like this a few years ago. He won a stage to the ski resort of the Station de Russe. And behind, uh, Simon Yates has left the other two and is chasing alone now up the mountain while the main field has started the climb as well here as we now continue on the first climb of the day and look at this now it is the team of Alberto Contador as they try to break the morale of Team Astana and in particular Vincenzo Nibali the leader 
Well, this man in the white jersey with the polka dots on it uh, at the back of the group, Phil, is the man who started the day as the leader of the King of the Mountains. But the damage is being done because of the pressure applied to the front of the race, no longer by Team Astana, but by Team Tinkoff Saxo, the team of Alberto Contador. Today, he realises there's an opportunity. He's a long way down in the overall standings after the cobbles. He's 2 minutes 37 seconds back. But today, if he can finish 10 or 15 seconds ahead of Vincenzo Nibali in the stage, he's going to start to ride himself back in. But Blel Kadri is riding away from the French time trial champion, Sylvain Chavanel. This is a move by Blel Kadri. Remember, he just has to top out on this climb to be the new leader in the King of the Mountains today. As Paul Sherwin told us earlier, he has worn that race leader's jersey on one day, on one occasion, but today is a good time to make a comeback. Lel Kadri, the most aggressive rider of the stage of the race a few days ago, is riding a very, very good Tour de France. The roads are good here. This is not the hardest of the climbs. Yes, it's the longest, almost five miles, eight kilometres, uh, but it's not the toughest. Uh, when they get to the next one, the noses will touch the road when they get out the saddle. But Blel Kadri has only won two races throughout his career, but he's a very good climber. The French have been waiting for quite some time for him to ride well in a Grand Tour like this. He's hitting a part of the race where it uh, peaks up to 8%. Sylvain Chavanel, Phil, who now sits in second position on the road, though, is, for me, a very seasoned professional rider. He won't want to push himself too hard and get himself into what the professional bike riders call the red zone, a place where he cannot recover. He will ride at his own pace. You have to remember about this man, Phil. He, he's not the greatest climber in the world, but when he goes in descender. Which is a big problem when he comes to the finish today because the climb continues even after they've crossed the finishing line. There's no descent when they hit the line today. This is the first of five finishes. And, well, if we thought Joachim Rodriguez was going to make an amazing comeback today, there he is, and he's losing contact with the field. Well, uh, let's not forget this man fighting his way back from injury, a very nasty crash uh, in the month of May in the Giro d'Italia. It's hard to bounce back from that, but he will bounce back and he'll stay in this race for as long as he can. But this is the first real show of force, and again, I'd have to say it's a little bit of a, a psychological battle as well going on between Alberto Contador's team and Vincenzo Nibali's team because they realise they've got to prove who's got the strongest team. We're looking a lot stronger than you are at the moment, and that could be important going into the next two big days in the mountains. So as the rides continue now, things are taking on a look of reality here. Nibali, Ricci Port, Talansky, Contador, Van Gogh, and these are the men we expect to be in the hunt for the final yellow jersey in Paris. They are now giving, giving themselves the opportunity to have a go at one another. They're still in that main pack while others are being dropped behind here. This is the man that really inspiring everybody rides for the French team. La Mondiale, the French rider, Biel Blel, Blel Kadri. A 5 3 2 1 of the points at the top of the climb. He only needs one to be the leader of the race in the King of the Mountains section. He's heading for five. Over the top for Bel Cadre, leader on the road of the King of the Mountains now. He's just moved up to 10 points in the competition. Uh, Cyril Lemoine has six. So the jersey is chasing now a polka dot. There's absolutely no hope that this rider can lead the Tour de France tonight. He's lost far too much time, but he would like to win the stage, that's for sure. Well, he certainly would, because let's not forget uh, the Tour de France uh, leader's jersey, the yellow jersey, is all about time, the addition of time. Uh, well, Del Cladri, who we've seen leading this race now, started the day 49 minutes behind Vincenzo Nibali in the overall classification. And in fact, uh, Sylvain Chavanel has lost a huge chunk of time over these last uh, couple of kilometres. He goes over the top there at 49 seconds. He's going to have to take some serious risks on the descent. Now, this is a bit of a surprise here because the man who started the day well up in the overall standings, Michael Kwiatkowski, is actually having a little bit of a hard time on this first incursion into the mountains. I'm quite surprised about that because I expected him to climb up a little higher in the standings tonight. Obviously, having a little bit of a hard day, this can happen to anybody. And after all, let's not forget, we're talking at one of the young riders in this race, one of the riders who is uh, learning the trade, learning the sport, as Kwiatkowski at 24 
years of age is not having his best day on the first incursion into the mountains. No, but he's tried so hard every day, almost to won a stage the other day as well, that um, this might be a little bit of a leveller to him today. The riders never know uh, how their legs are going to react to the first day in the mountains. What's well, not so great, uh, we get a chance to see the time of the ascent there of uh, Blel Kadri, uh, just 18 and a half minutes, but you might have noticed in the distance, we go down this descent at high speeds, and he'll find his legs getting a little bit cool by the rain that's been banging down upon them. He'll go into the town of La Bresse, and then he will climb the penultimate climb of the day, the Col de Grosse Pierre, or the Big Stones. Well, as they continue to fly away from the top of this first climb, they won't be flying up the next one, which is the Col de Grosse Pierre. It is very, very sharp. 16% gradient on the next climb. As the peloton now pass under 20 kilometers to go, the gap four and a half minutes plus. Rafael Machka still sets the pace here, the Polish member of Tinkov Sakra, Saxo. Simon Yates is still showing up on our computer as chasing. He's gone over the top in third place, got himself his first points in the King of the Mountains today. Simon Yates, two for third. Yes, he's uh, got himself up there. It's Ben King at the back there for Garmin Sharp, uh, just staying in contact. Uh, lots of. Uh, Lots of social media communication between Ben King and Ted King. Uh, difficult to have two Americans uh, call King in the same Tour de France, but they seem to be making quite a joke out of it. This man, though, now uh, I think uh, the advantage on this kind of a descent like this is actually going to tip towards Sylvain Chavanel because it's not a very difficult technical descent. It's one way you can use your power, and Sylvain Chavanel certainly has the power as the gap is hovering at about 50 seconds. But look at the difference in the styles, and look at the urgency of Sylvain Chavanel comes out of the cap and starts to wind it up. Well, he is once more the National Time Trial Championship. In fact, that was Yates' second appearance in the King of the Mountains. He's now got three points. Yeah, so uh, Kadri again... Uh, Another man uh, slipping off the back. Uh, this is uh, Heimar Zubeldia. Uh, he's struggling with this first incursion. Now, a lot of riders, after we've spent uh, seven days racing on the flat, using a big gear, the largest chainring at the front, the smallest uh, sprocket at the back, all of a sudden, you're changing your pedaling style, you're changing your pedaling gears, and it can be a big shock to the system and sometimes take one or two days to get into what the riders call their climbing legs, and that could be what's happening to Heimar Zubeldia there. This is the second man on the road. The leader is Blel Kadri of AG2R. Now, the amazing thing about that French team. It's, it's one of the smaller French teams. It's what a team with the, on the international circuit with one of the smaller budgets, but they nearly always manage to come up at the Tour de France and get themselves a little victory. A chance here to see the time of the ascent of the Col de la Croix de Mona, 18.28 for Blel Cadri. The main field went up uh, just a little bit faster than that at 17 minutes and 44. They really are storming, and that's all because of the pressure that was being applied by this team here. 15 kilometers to go now over on the left hand side uh, you can see uh, that was uh, Vasily Kirienka moving Richie Port to the front of the main field keeping him out of danger as we look at the riders here they are still on a little bit of a descent here but they're about to hit the slopes of the second climb now the Col de Grosse Pierre now this is a seriously steep climb by any standards it kicks up to 16 percent gradients here and this is going to hurt the peloton Paul slowly but surely the pack of riders has been split Contador is using all of his team here one by one there's no doubt he's going to hit them soon well he's going to wait till that final climb uh, he knows that uh, the next climb of the day is uh, not one of the big long climbs but this is all psychological warfare if you like he's gone to the overall leader Vincenzo Nibali and said look mate your team have shown us that they're extremely strong over the first uh, few flat stages of the Tour de France but now we're coming into my domain now we're coming into the mountains and I'm going to show you that I've got a strong team to support me well, there's a, he almost overshot that corner then, uh, Sylvain Chavanel. He's, he's got himself straightened out a little bit as we start this next climb. But this is very, very narrow indeed. This is the Col de la Croix de, uh, Col de Grosse Pierre. It's uh, just under two miles in length. But the thing is that for quite a long way, it is at 16%. And that's going to hurt the riders now. Well, just talking to Rolf Sorensen, a former wearer of the yellow jersey at the Tour de France, who uh, works with Danish television, he actually went out onto the course and looked at this uh, 
penultimate climb of the day. He says it's a lot harder than it actually looks in the race handbook because there's this point where it kicks up to 25%. This is Mickey Rogers or Michael Rogers there, three times champion of the world in the individual time trial himself and a guy who really uh, started racing at the Giro d'Italia this year and I think he's finding some serious form. He's going to be a major ally for Alberto Contador later on. Well, Kadri here now has 10 points in the King of the Mountains competition. There's another five if he gets over the top and that would really help him. He's already in the polka dot jersey tonight. Well, a nice story about Belcadri, a man who was born in Bordeaux in the wine-growing region of France, although he grew up in Toulouse. He really likes riding a bike as a kid, but his mum said to him, you know, if you don't do well at school, I'm going to ban you from bike riding. <laughs> so he succeeded at school before he turned to professional cycling. Uh, especially as we're leading up to a pretty important weekend for France as well, Phil, because Monday is a public holiday. It's the biggest French public holiday. It's Bastille Day, the 14 juillet. And for a man to win over this weekend from Ooh. France, it really is important. Don't worry, that's the guy who was in I the know. breakaway, Petit. He's coming back, but Tinkoff are in serious control. And if you look at this group, we've had a very big decanting of a lot of people from this group Ben King on the right hand side wearing number 95 Chris Horner not surprising Phil that he's put into a little bit of difficulty but you know at 42 years of age let's not forget he won the Vuelta a España last year as the lone leader now Blel Kadri is going to grab himself five more points in the King of the Mountains competition at least he'll have a polka dot jersey as leader of that competition tonight and it's looking very very likely that he'll win the stage two nobody can can catch him as far as the race leading the King of the Mountains goes today but I think they might be able to catch him yet the reason I jumped there when Adrian Petit was caught was because he was the first of the five men in the breakaway to be swept up by the chase and remember only about 10-15 kilometers ago they had a lead of over nine minutes and Michael Rogers the camera rider is the rider bringing up uh, Alberto Contador I think because of the nature of the last time where there are, there's time to be gained that is where we are going Going to see the final attack we're looking at uh, Rafael Majka here he was the pacemaker until Rogers took over job done he'll fall back and try and get home as best he can now it, it is up to Michael Rogers to, uh, uh, to perform the springboard for Nicholas Roach to help Alberto Contador fly away well there's lots and lots of riders disappearing from the back of the group I just noticed uh, Vasily Kirienka slipping backwards uh, Stefan Kreisweg from Team Belkin 10 kilometers to go, we've still got him out front. Blel Cladry is going for goal now. Nobody can catch him tonight for the polka dot jersey. That'll be his as the finish. What a day it would be for the Frenchman if he could win the stage as well. He's never done that before. No, but what a team as well, Phil. AG2R are one of the French teams on the international circuit with one of the smaller budgets. But every time it comes to the Tour de France, they always seem to come up with the goods. They always seem to get themselves a stage victory. Well, there's the first man amongst the leaderboard being dropped, uh, Tony Gallopan. He's losing his high place overall tonight. There'll be a reshuffle of the classification as the men with the, who are not the pretenders for the throne in Paris start to apply the pressure. See how narrow this road is. It's also a very rough road surface. Uh, little chippings are into the tarmac on the surface of this road make it very difficult to find any speed. Michael Rogers is looking quite powerful and comfortable here. Behind him, Nicholas Roach, uh, the son of Stephen Roach who won the Tour de France back in 1987 and sitting pretty comfortably there just a little bit further back is Alberto Contador but not sitting comfortably number 151 one of the French favourites Pierre Roland yes. looks in a spot of bother he's already lost six minutes and he's right on the tail of the group here and that is not a good sign for a man who has finished best Frenchman in the Tour de France this is the section which really snaps your legs our television camera does not do it justice it's 13% at this point the face of Michael Rogers, the Canberra former World Time Trial champion from Australia, is doing his job now to set the launch of Alberto Contador. Coming back to the leader now, 3.53, still holds a gap pole, there is a chance he's going to have the best day of his life on the bike, this man. We're going into the fog that was forecast as well, all the weather forecast, unfortunately, proving correct today as we go back to Rogers.
looking for. It's a question of a little bit of time here and there every day that he can now on the running down through these bows over the next uh, three days of racing. It's rather a surprise. No, Jakob Fulsang as well is disappearing. He wears number 42. He started the day in second position in the overall standings. Phil, we're going to have a completely different overall classification tonight. This is the first major sort out and it's only the last 20 kilometres of the first mountain stage. Well, Sa Fulsang is going. Peter Sagan has gone. Kwiatkowski has gone. Haven't found Jürgen van den Broek yet. Tony Gallopan has gone. Those boys are losing their place in the top six riders tonight as we go back to the leader he's being inspired now by the fact he is still holding three minutes and 54 seconds if he can get to the bottom of the climb in the town of Gerdemar himself then he's got a chance to run away with this and what a result don't take too many risks oh my goodness me we almost slid with him there well, uh, this is the time when you have to have nerves of steel, uh, and especially when you think that you're going to win a stage in the Tour de France, you want to push it to the absolute limit. Any risk that you can to gain an extra second here or there. He needs to calm down a fraction. He's not going to take the overall lead today, Phil. He rode that final climb there very quickly, the ascension of the Col de Grosse Pierre. Yeah just about 30 seconds slower than the main field but that's not bad you know when you know he's been leading this race for a good uh, 18 miles or so he's got a one and a half minute advantage over Sylvain Chavanel he does not need to panic he's not going to lose uh, that much time on this final climb of the day he's got to think now of surviving and winning the stage because that is something the most shallow of the mountains but that uh, is not the case when we get onto it we're now in the other side of the Col de Cruz Pierre and as you can see on the other side side of the mountain uh, the weather has deteriorated rather rapidly but these wonderful uh, fluorescent jerseys of Tinkoff Saxo standing out like beacons at the head of this pack and it's the third rider in line that the whole pack is waiting to see make his move and knowing Contador he will jump the minute we start the last climb of the day well, it might look a little bit grim here, sitting in our armchairs in the commentary position at the finish line, but having been in conditions like this before, you, you might think that this darkness and this rain is uh, a bit of a problem for the riders, but nowadays, with the advent of a lot of these special glasses that the riders wear, it's actually not too bad at all. In fact, it's a lot better than it was 20 or 30 years ago. This group on the road is going down this hill at speeds of 44 miles an hour currently. You can see 60 kilometres an hour. Mickey Rogers has not yet turned around and looked behind Behind him or ask anybody for any assistance at all he knows his job his job will finish today once he gets his teammates Alberto Contador and still Nicholas Roach to the foot of that final climb of the day in a good and safe position then I think he'll raise the white flag and uh, just cruise up to the finishing line here on the line and I'll tell you what uh, that's known by the race leader Nibali Nibali is sitting locked on to the back wheel of Alberto Contador waiting for him to launch that attack and he's got the buffer of over two and a half minutes uh, on the race so far after eight days of racing advantage over Alberto Contador so he's not going to let him out of his sight if he can actually hold him which is another thing with the great Spanish climber so we run down now four kilometers to go to the finish whoa and a great piece of descending here but unfortunately he's run out of his teammates he's gonna have to wait well, he needs to slow down a fraction. A bit of enthusiasm there for a man who turned professional back in 2001. As we mentioned earlier, you know, he's been a great competitor, three times world time trial champion. He's uh, coming up to 35 years of age. He actually had a good start to the era with uh, two stage victories in the Giro d'Italia and a third place overall in the Route du Sud. Well, for me, Michael Rogers is riding back at the finest we've ever seen him riding. And this is Frank Schleck here, the champion of Luxembourg. He lost his brother Andy earlier on in the race with a bad accident and uh, an injury, an operation on his left knee. Uh, Franks, though, seems to be uh, sorting himself out here. And Fulsang is coming back as well. He's yo-yoing on and off at the moment. Well, he's taken a few risks and too many risks going around that oh, corner. Well done, he held it. Uh, well, that was uh, Tanel Kanga, the Estonian rider on that squad. And you see how he's got his foot out as quickly as possible, and that crowd got a very <laughs> close view of the Tour de France. And uh, no, you don't need to take that chair with you. But the thing is, Tanel Kanga himself is riding with a badly damaged wrist here and uh, almost abandoned the race yesterday. So that's probably why he couldn't get round that bend. 
So we are now with the leader here at the front, and this is Blel Kadri out front, 2.6 kilometres to go. Uh, unfortunately, it's a rather hard finish today, and there's no confirmation he will survive, but one would like to think so, having been ahead since the 28th kilometre. As we look at uh, Jakob Fulsang here now, also riding himself... Well, no, he isn't. He's actually not got back at all. Well, he almost made contact on the descent. He obviously took a lot of risk going downhill there, Phil, as we go back to the lone leader. Lel Kadri is into the town of Jeramé. All he faces up to now is the climb to the ski resort. We will turn left, we will turn right, we will start the climb to the finish. Here's the little turn, first of all, to the right. We didn't see this this morning, there was no barriers up. And then we start the climb. Looks very gentle at first. Then we get round the corner, and he's on it. 3.29 advantage when he starts the climb. It should be enough. Well, it should be enough. Uh, the climb's only just over a mile in length, but the gradient, that's what hurts. 10.3%, and he finishes right on the line, and he'll be looking for a few more points as well, so that'll give him quite a convincing lead in the King of the Mountains classification, but he's not worried about that, Phil. He wants to win the stage. He wants to get glory for France. A little bit better ride here for 171. Daniel Navarro there, he's had a bad tour so far, but he's still in touch with this leading peloton with Frank Schleck. But what about this man now, Blel Kadri in his fourth Tour de France, and now we're really seeing him at his best. The crowd here have stood in this pouring rain for hours, but they haven't gone away, and I can tell you the summit has a huge crowd waiting with the umbrellas up. And he's now all he's run in his, his life in the Tour de France before today is to wear the King of the Mountains jersey for a single day. It'll be his again tonight, but what he really wants is a stage win. Well, you have to understand about Professor cyclist Phil is everyone has a specific attribute now this man is a climber he's a born climber you can see by the by the body build that he's got and even when he's tired look at those skinny little legs that he's got he's not a sprinter he's not Marcel Kittel who can do the hundred meters in inside of 10 seconds he is a climber he's trained for this kind of event and even when he's tired he will able be be able to climb and dance up this hill 1.3 kilometers to go to the finish it's going to take him a two and a half minutes or so then not not going to see him again this afternoon it's just a question of how much time he's got there's a crash at the back what? and this is Talansky Talansky's uh, gone down, down again he's just come on the bend there talansky has gone down again this is Frank Schleck we switch to as he races past the crash scene but Talansky on that right hand bend has gone down again and he's also with Geraint Thomas there well Phil one thing to remember here is the fact is this is a mountain top finish so he is going to lose time here this afternoon he started the day in eight Eighth place in the overall standings looking for 205 so he will drop down in the overall standings tonight well Thomas also it was 15th overall and he will lose time unless they can get back on the climb up towards the finish rather sad that Frank Schleck the rider going by they got first-hand information there as he saw the riders slip away the leader though is at one kilometer to go now on what has been his most glorious day as a professional cyclist throughout his career which started back in 2009 he has won only two bicycle races now he's about to win a stage of the Tour de France and his management is going to congratulate him before we even get to the line what a day out for Blel Kadri Well, still drama behind and Talansky down again in the closing stages of a, of a stage in as many days. Five, six, eight hundred metres to go. Well, eight hundred metres to go for this man. It's just a question of enjoying the final few metres, but the uh, main now field the now is starting the climb. Mickey Rogers has done his job. It's Nicholas Roach now who will turn himself inside out for his leader. And still, Alberto Contador in second place does not look to be suffering at all. But look who's locked onto the wheel of uh, 
Contador behind him, Nibali behind him, Richie Port. They've been there, locked on for the last 20 kilometers. They're still waiting for Contador to make an attack and try and grab time. Contador looks over his left shoulder. He sees Nibali in the eyes. I spotted the American rider TJ Van Garderen. So unfortunate yesterday. He's just on the back end of that group, so he will be moving himself up in the overall standings tonight. But this final few hundred meters, Phil, must seem absolutely interminable to this man here. He's still got the bit of energy. Oh. Simon Yates, well, he's been caught. I thought he was going to make it to third, but Simon Yates uh, back in the main chase group now. Didn't quite get there. Nicky Turfs is still away. Haven't seen him recently, though. Well, uh, there's going to be uh, a question as to what... Well, 500 meters to go. This is a long, long way. You know these me meters, Phil? I think they stretch them in France when they put the roads <laughs> uphill. And they're six feet on the climbs. But look at the face here of Blel Kadri, and well, it might look like this. He's been in the lead for 132 kilometres today. It was a real hard challenge to catch up with the two leaders as well. He did that. He rode away from them. But he's looking a bit further down. This is Jürgen Vandenbroek here, but it looks low as he also is in a spot of bother. Another man could be losing his high finish in the Tour de France. And at the back, the front of the peloton, we've got uh, TJ Van Garden also trying to act and get through. He's going to challenge now Alberto Contador well a lot of action now as they really try to put the hammer down in the main field but uh, one Frenchman is enjoying his day uh, looking for a victory this afternoon it will look so though as we go back to the finishing camera now this man now can relax over the last few hundred meters he will enjoy this victory as you said Phil he's only won two races before this one but this is the biggest well I've just heard on the radio Contador has made his move there it is Contador and looks side by side at a kilometre to go. The Mayo Jean, he took the lead in Sheffield a week ago. He's still in the yellow jersey. They pick up Nicky Turfter, he's gone now. They're racing for second place and Contador is trying to go. Well, I think uh, Sylvain Chavanel has Chavanel survived, well. so they're actually Sorry, racing for third that. position. <laughs> Look at this, he's trying to get this victory salute out of the way. This is the winner of the stage, by the way, let's not forget. He comes up in the pouring rain now as Blel Kadri gets the one most wonderful moment of his career. All smiles despite the pain and rain of the day. Blel Kadri wins the stage and he becomes the next leader of the King of the Mountains. Maximum points on the three climbs today. And Chavanel is back, so now we are racing for second place. Two well, top riders head to head. Well, Sylvain Chavanel, I thought he had enough time at the start of this climb, Phil, just to survive and hold on. Nibali, he's just holding on. You know, at the start of the day, Alberto Contador said, no, no, this is a Vincenzo Nibali kind of finish this afternoon. But you know what? Alberto Contador plays a very, very game of cards. I don't think I want to play poker with him. Well, Richie Port is climbing back up, the leader of Team Sky after the demise of defending champion Chris Froome the other day and now we're looking here Nibali is turning out to be the man because Contador with his famous accelerations on the steepest part of the climb cannot unship the Mayo Jean well there's congratulations for the man of the day for France though let's not forget Blel Kadri he's got the victory but now it's a question of psychology now Phil uh, is Alberto Contador going to try and beat Vincenzo Nibali to the line here to say look I'm faster than you but this man in second position in the yellow jersey just needs to stay there Richie Port he's is coming. climbing high high up in the overall standings tonight as Silva Chavanel is tailed off it's shoulder to shoulder for the two race favourites in the absence now of Chris Froome but maybe there's another race favourite in black trying to get on terms with them as well uh, this is into the mist again now shoulder to shoulder well either Nibali is having a great day or Contador is having a bad day but he can't get rid of the Mayo Jean he can't but he's looking at the time that he's putting between himself and everybody else I wonder if uh, Vincenzo Nibali Phil is just thinking I'm quite happy to stay here Contador looks just so relaxed there's a bit of wheezing going on for the man in the yellow jersey but this is a great battle mano a mano now is there going to be a psychological blow from Contador to try and get himself second place on the stage as Richie Poor rides slowly back he's climbing up maybe to second place overall tonight the Australian looking at Contador he goes now if there's a gap opens up they will give him a separate time but hey one or two seconds wasn't quite the plan for Alberto Contador as he hits the line there he'll probably get a couple of seconds then comes Nibali in third place and then Richie Port in fourth place well done to Port 
I think it's Thibaut Pino came across there in fifth. Yes, it is. There he is coming across. Uh, Jean-Christophe Perrault is the next rider up there. Alejandro Valverde coming across. And then in the red and black jersey, TJ Van Garderen. So he will make a recovery after the accident of yesterday. Yes, he, I think it was eighth uh, for him over the line. But time is what counts. He conceded 24 seconds to the yellow jersey there. Uh, but these are all unofficial times, of course. But uh, the big loser, I think, today, sadly, I have to say, because I'm sure this guy's going places, but Andrew Chalansky uh, crashing there has not come back into our camera, so he's losing time. Yes, two crashes in two days is not uh, great fun for anybody in the sport of professional cycling, but when you start the day in the top ten in the overall standings, it's even tougher to uh, carry off. There, though, let's not forget a victory for France on a very important holiday weekend for the French. Oui, effectivement, Blais Cadric est en face de moi. Sincèrement, c'était magnifique. Well, they're still... well yeah, sincerely, yeah, that was magnificent. It's a crazy thing. When I was at the front, I wasn't thinking that we were going to go to the finish. And I, um, I, I, didn't, I was thinking about the thing that my teammate Riblon did last year. I knew one day it was going to smile. And I'm very, very happy. There's Quickly, uh, according to the quick calculation, uh, Kadri gets the stage 217 ahead of Alberto Contador, 220, just three seconds of grappled back over Vincenzo Nibali. Richie poured into fourth place at 224, Thibaut Pino fifth, uh, Jean Christophe Perrault in sixth, Valverde van Garderen, Roman Bardet of France, and uh, Sylvain Chavanel just hanging on for tenth place. But Contador. Well, it's going to be a bit of fun over the next couple of days because Contador looks like he's got his big old climbing legs back again. Kwiatkowski uh, theoretically has uh, moved up into fourth place overall. It'll take a while to calculate these new changes, but the overall classification is going to have a very, very different look at the end of today. Particularly first blow, Fulsang did a pretty impressive job to hang on to second place, and Richie Port is just tickling second position because he's now up into third third hello welcome to stage nine of the tour de france the rolling countryside is a peaceful place for holiday but it can be a stressful place to defend the race lead Stage nine, and it starts in Jarome, makes its way through to Malouze. It's some 170 kilometers, and it is scattered with climbs. In fact, we've got our first category one climb of this year's tour. There's six coals to be ascended in total. It looks like a major day in the mountains in reverse because it's a flat run towards the finish. Weather conditions at the start in Jarame, much better than what they were yesterday. The stage today is starting down in the town itself as opposed to the top of the climb where we saw it finish yesterday. Two former teammates at the front, the green jersey with Peter Sagan, riding alongside Vincenzo Nibali, the overall race leader. They were teammates at Liquigas, which is now known as Cannondale. Sagan has stayed there. This man has moved on. It was a relatively short neutral zone on today's stage, just about 10 minutes. Didn't take long though for the attacks to start coming. Francis de Jure or FDJ.FR, they were the first team to make the move. As soon as they went off the start, they were right onto the first climb of the day, Category 2 climb, and across the top, it was Thomas Vockler who led over the top of the climb ahead of Nicola Ede. We've now got a break away that has formed with two men off the front. They have a 35 second lead on a chasing group of 26. This is Alessandro Damaki from the Cannondale squad. A teammate of Peter Sagan. Not a day for the Slovak national champion today. So the Italian gets a little bit of freedom. Minute and 12 seconds, that's the advantage on the group that contains the yellow jersey. Tony Martin, he's the man who started this move. The triple world time trial champion. This is the chasing group. This is Danny Navarro who's at the front for Kofidis. A couple of riders in this move from the Europe card team. Cyril Gutier is one of them. So too is Pierre Roland. This is Louis Vester at the front of the main peloton for Astana. They will start to be put to the test now. 
has at the front of the race with uh, Tony Martin and Alexandra Demarki. They're about to make their way over the top of the Col de Vestain, the second climb of the day. This is a Category 3 climb. So just two points for Demarki as he goes across the top. One point for Tony Martin in the race for that King of the Mountains jersey. These two men not overly concerned about the polka dots. Neither of them any threat at all to the race leader, Vicenzo Nibali. Tony Martin is the best placed at 18 minutes and 27 seconds behind. The rider who sets in second position in this group, that is none other than Joaquin Rodriguez, the third place finisher from the Tour de France of last year. Cancellari is here, Tony Gallopin for the Lotto Balasol squad. And Rodriguez going forward. But there are no points in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey. Sylvain Chavanel from the I Am Cycling, he's second day in the breakaway. Emile Monar is also there for the BMC Racing Squad. And that did look like the figure, once again, of Simon Yates from Orica Green Edge at the back of the group. Well, it is quite a large group. Astana with all their riders back in the main peloton, protecting the yellow jersey. Alexander Vinokurov was on French television two days ago and he said the team will not crack. We'll find out soon enough. Tinkoff Saxo have got other ideas. They did all they could to test them yesterday. They really isolated the race leader by the time we arrived at the finish line. This is the National Necropolis of Vetstein. There's some 3,538 French soldiers buried here. And there's the War Memorial, the Blue Devils. And there's the recumbent statue, which stands at the foot of one of the crosses that we have here, which represents a mountain infantry man who fell throughout the First World War. And you can see they've preserved some of the fortifications from the First World War. There was a big battle in this region, the Battle of Lin, which was between the French and German soldiers from the 20th of July through to the 16th of October. That was in 1995. 1915, I should say. Significantly different. 1915, correction, throughout the First World War. A strategic position as we're right next to the German-French border throughout today's stage. In fact, some parts have swapped hands pretty regularly throughout the past few hundred years. In fact, throughout the past 1,000 years. But it is the French flag that flies here now. So that group at 47 seconds, Fabian Cancellara is also in that group. Nicola Ede for the Cafetas team. He's managed to make it across. And Christian Meyer is the rider who's managed to make it into that group from Orica Greenwich, not Simon Yates. It's Christian Meyer, the Canadian who was the late call-up for the team. So he's making the most of his opportunity. The Belkham team, their team leader, Bolka Mollema, yesterday, a little disappointing. This looks like Tom Leeser, who's working his way around to the other side so as he can find his team leader. There he is, just a little bit further back down the road on the left-hand side. He was the last rider in line in the Belkham colours. Jakob Fulsang sits almost directly behind the yellow jersey of Vicenzo Nibali, with the yellow helmet on and the glasses poking into the top of them. Second place overall that his objectives aren't about his own interests. They're about the interests of Vicenzo Nibali. Just saw confirmation as they went across the top of that category at three climb with the Col de Vestain. It was Demarki collecting two points, Tony Martin the one point. Just to go, it was TJ Van Garderen who crashed and Greg Van Avermaet was at the front, one of his teammates, forcing the issue, looking for the opportunity to win the stage. Diego Machado, the Portuguese rider at the back for Net App Indura. Two riders in this group from the Cofita squad, Navarro, who we've spoken about. This is Nicola Ede now who sits at the back. Simon Spilak is in the move for Katusha, although it has started to split up a little bit. 
Europe car with Pierre Rolland after finishing fourth in this year's at Giro d'Italia. He finds himself in 23rd position overall at 7 minutes and 34 seconds down. It's his teammate in the green, number 157, Peric Cumier, who's also in this group. 42 seconds behind our two leaders. So we've got now five major groups on the road. Two leaders out in front, eight chasing at 42 seconds behind. Another group of 19. Then the main peloton that contains the yellow jersey along with the white jersey and the green jersey. That's Nabali, Kwiatkowski and Sagan. And then there is a group with the sprinters, the likes of Demar, Kittel, Renshaw. They've formed the Gruppetto fairly early, which is understandable. Category 2 climb to get things started. That gap of 2 minutes and 1 seconds, that is back to the yellow jersey group. The Pierre Rolland is starting to close in, now down to 38 seconds. Tony Martin, he was so close to a stage win last year in the Tour of Spain. He had a day-long breakaway. And he was caught with around about 50 metres to go. Maybe just a fraction more. It certainly wasn't more than 100 metres to go. A bunch sprint came over the top of him and Michael Morkov managed to win the stage. This is the group containing Sylvain Chabanel. Christian Meyer is the man who is in the move for the Orica Green Edge squad. Chavanel, understandably, doing all he can to make the most of the descent. Another bold performance by Sylvain Chavanel yesterday. We wouldn't expect anything less from the Frenchman. He doesn't tend to say a lot off the bike, Sylvain Chavanel. He's open. He's not a closed book by any stretch of the imagination. But he's not one of those riders that boasts a whole lot. He tends to let his legs do the talking. The return to the leaders, an Italian and a German off the front as they race along the French-German border. For Alessandro De Marchi to try and hold on to. Stage 9 of the Tour de France as they make their way through the Vosges Mountains once again. This is the situation of the race. A breakaway group of two off the front. And it includes the multiple world time trial champion, Tony Martin, from the Omega Pharma Quickstep team. He's been joined by the Italian from Canada. This is Alessandro De Marchi who sits just behind him. And then there's a large contingent of riders trying to chase. There's a group of eight who are around about 43 seconds behind. Then there's a group of 19, followed by the yellow jersey group at two minutes and three seconds. For those of you joining us down in Australia, welcome to the stage. It's been a fair bit throughout the first few kilometres, particularly as it opened up with a Category 2 climb. When they went over the climb, Thomas Vaucler, not surprisingly, after seeing a Frenchman win the stage yesterday, was trying to get his name up towards the front. And that he certainly did manage to do. It was Vaucler who led over the top of the first climb, ahead of Nicolas Edde. And then on the descent, we saw the group start to form at the front with our two riders managing to open up a small gap. And now the chase is on in earnest. This is the chasing group. It's Matteo Monteguti who sits at the back for AG to our Le Mondial. And the pressure is off a little bit for this French team. After that stage win yesterday, they also lead the King of the Mountains classification. Belcadri it was who won the stage yesterday. Brilliant performance in the rain. This is Danny Navarro in the red colours of the Cofidis squad. He's joined by Nicola Ede. So two riders in this group from Cofidis and two riders in the move as well from Europe Car. Pierre Rolland is in the break. The man who finished fourth at this year's Giro d'Italia. He came here with an outside hope for a top 10 finish in the Tour de France. Notably, keeping in mind the fatigue from the first Grand Tour of the season. He's in that chasing group, so too is his teammate, Perique Cumier. Now the challenge being put to Astana. How do they handle the responsibility of trying to control the whole race? 
particularly on such a tactically difficult one like this. Sebastian Langeveld at the back, the Dutch national champion. We had a chance to catch up with his teammate this morning, Andrew Talansky, who has really shown his strength of character. He had a crash two days ago, the crash that involved controversially the Australian national champion, Simon Gerrans. It was a bit heated at the end of the stage, Andrew Talansky. He was blaming Gerrans. Gerrans said, take a look at the video footage. And plenty of other riders in the race suggested that Talansky should take a look at the footage as well. Well, he had nobody to blame yesterday, Andrew Talansky. He crashed once again. He conceded two minutes. But this morning when he spoke to us, he'd put all of that behind him. He said all he can do now is focus on trying to win a stage and claw his way back up the general classification. He noted that yesterday on the final climb, he was riding about the same speed as the leaders, and that has filled him with optimism. This is Thiago Machado in the blue colours of Net App Endura. Portuguese rider, he's had a good season so far. His first attempt at the Tour de France. Simon Spilak for Katusha, Danny Navarro. Ninth in last year's Tour de France. A former teammate of Alberto Contador. And up until last year, he was one of Alberto Contador's key lieutenants for the mountains. He figured, if I can stay with Alberto for this long, maybe I should have a go for myself, at least once in my career. Much like we saw with Mark Renshaw. After having spent so much time in his career, trying to lead out Mark Cavendish for stage victories. The past two seasons, Mark Renshaw decided to have a go himself at being the team leader. Didn't quite work out. He's back riding alongside Mark Cavendish. But you'll never know if you don't have a go. So Mark Renshaw, in my view, made the right decision to attempt the role of being the team leader. He's now back with Mark Cavendish. This looks like Maxim McGlinsky at the front for the Astana squad. Two days ago, Alexander Vinokurov, the team manager, the head of the Astana squad, he spoke to French television. He said, sure, it would be better if another one of the teams had the yellow jersey to defend at this point, but we're not about to surrender it, and we will not break. This is Pierre Roland. Not sure if you could hear that scraping. It sounded very much like the foot pegs on the motorbike carrying our camera that sits in front of Pierre Roland. Scraping along the ground as they went around that corner. They might need to put Troy Corsa on board to ride the bike for them. Tony Martin with some freedom on today's stage. They've had an interesting race, Omega Farmer Quick Step. Such high hopes throughout the first week for Mark Cavendish. They all came crashing down with some 200 metres to go on stage one. Michael kwiatkowski has been doing a lot of work supporting his teammates, yet he wears the white jersey as the best young rider and looked as if he struggled a little yesterday. But of course, they did have that stage one win in a photo finish for Matteo Trentin just two days ago into Nancy. It will be a stage that will be remembered for a long time. A controversial day with a lot of crashes. The race director, Christian Prudhomme, has described today's stage as not a metre of flat road for the first 130 kilometres. It's either up or down until they get down to the last 40 or so k's, and then it's a flat run through to the finish line in Malouz. Astana still controlling affairs at the front of the race for Vicenzo Nibali. Minute and 31 seconds now, the deficit for the main peloton. This looks like Simon Yates at the back of the group for Orica Greenedge. And that group in the middle, they're stuck at 31 seconds. They're making a little bit of progress, but not a lot. The past couple of days, they've been challenging for the American Andrew Talansky. This crash two days ago in the sprint finish towards Nancy. Yesterday in the rain, slippery conditions, he came undone once again. Stuck on the side of the road, he was left to try and fix the bike himself. He'd lost two minutes by the end of the stage. 
But Andrew Talansky, this morning before the stage got underway, we caught up with him. He showed his courage. I would say what hurts worse is mentally knowing um, how I was yesterday and, and seeing uh, the times the guys finished buying Contador and Nibbly and knowing that, you know, really except for Contador and Nibbly, there wasn't anybody who went up the hill any much faster than I did because that time I lost was just spent on the side of the road dealing with the bike situation and trying to collect myself again. So that's actually pretty motivating. It's, all, it's just mentally hard. You want to be there in the final of the race with the best guys. So, you know, I'm looking forward to the chance when I when I do get to do that. That stage win for Lars Bohm was the first for a Dutch cyclist since 2005. And that stage win came in the same town as where yesterday's stage finished. For Peter Winning, the Dutch are delighted that they're no longer talking about, well, who's going to be the next Dutchman to win a stage? It's a significant day today as well for Italian cycling. Today marks the 200th day of the Tour de France that an Italian has worn the yellow jersey. That's Vincenzo Nibali who leads the race. He spoke highly after yesterday's stage of the prospects of Richie Port in this year's race. He said that Alberto Contador is the most dangerous, but Richie Port is very strong. And he's got a team around him that know how to race for yellow at the Tour. So the race leader, he's not just worried about Alberto Contador, and understandably so. He's thinking about Richie Port, the prospects of Port being able to challenge. He also named Alejandro Valverde. And he put out there that the Frenchman, Thibaut Pinot, has been pretty impressive throughout the first day of climbing. Latest update from Race Radio is that group of Pierre Rolland is at 23 seconds behind the two leaders. Tony Martin has won two stages of the Tour de France in the past, but both of those individual time trials. No doubt he would dearly love to win a road stage. He's a little bit heavier than Alessandro DeMarchi, and he's just rolling away from him. Oh, this chasing group in the middle with Lars Bohm descending away from them. One of the best bike handlers in the world. We saw plenty of evidence of that on stage five. It was nice to see his wife and daughter at the end of the stage as well to celebrate the victory. He was clearly pretty optimistic about that day, understandably so. As for the fallout from yesterday's stage, Alberto Contador himself was pretty happy with how things went. He only took three seconds off the yellow jersey, but it could be a sign of things to come as the climbs get bigger. And tomorrow we have the first genuine mountaintop finish of this year's race. And for Alberto Contador to get on level, pegging with the yellow jersey before the individual time trial on the penultimate stage, he needs to take 30 seconds out of Vicenzo Nibli on each mountaintop finish. Yesterday he took just the three. Admittedly, it was only a Category 3 climb yesterday, and we've got some big ones to come. Category 1 climb at the end of tomorrow's stage. Making their way through the town of Tuckheim. This is Kevin Retza from the Europe Car team. Cyril Gutier, also from Europe Car. This is Machado from Net App Endura. And you wouldn't expect Carsten Corrin from the Cannondale team to do too much of the chasing. Although the group at just 23 seconds. In fact, this is the group that sits behind Lars Bohm. So this is the large group that also includes. Joaquin Rodriguez, so it looks as if it has actually absorbed the group with Pierre Rolland and Greg Van Overman. Back to the two leaders. Not much they can do about what is happening behind. Neither of them any challenge for the yellow jersey of Vicenzo Nibali, so Astana won't be too concerned. They'll be happy to let this group just drift away. Tony Martin, he sits in 39th position overall. He's at 18 minutes and 27 seconds off the pace. And as for the Italian DeMarchi, well, he's some 49 minutes and 50 seconds away from that yellow jersey. Frederick II. Just briefly back to Simon Yates. Shane Bannon, who's the team manager for Orica Green Edge, has said that given he's only 21, and it is his first season in the professional ranks, 
they're going to assess it day by day once they get past the first rest day which is on Tuesday and they might even pull him out of the race early regardless of what he says in terms of how he feels the doctors are going to monitor his progress as they don't want to burn the motor out they're thinking long term with Simon Yates Lorenza, Kumier, and then it is roll on for Europe car. Montaguti is the rider who's in the break today for AG Tuar Le Mondial. He's one of the two riders in the break at least. Sorel is the other rider that's in the move. Dumoulin is the rider who's managed to make it into the break for Giant Shimano. This is Kruzweig in the green colours of the Balkan squad. Fabian Cancellara is there for Trek Factory Racing. There's a large group of 28s. Heading into Malouz today, it will bring back some fond memories for Jens Voigt. It was here back in 2005 that he took the yellow jersey for two days. Tinkoff Saxo with one rider in the breakaway today. That's Sergio Paulinho, the Portuguese rider on that team. Of Portuguese cycling that we've seen at the Tour de France for a long time. In fact, there's four riders from Portugal, and one of them happens to be the world champion, Rui Costa. He ended the stage frustrated yesterday, Rui Costa. He said he had good legs, he was right there with the leaders. He had a mechanical problem, his chain slipped at around about the 800 metre to go mark. Back to the Astana led peloton. This is Gruzdev who sits at the front for Astana. A large flotilla of team cars making their way forward to go across and join that large group of 28 who are still trying to close down on Demarki and Tony Martin. One kilometre to the top for the two leaders. And the strength of Tony Martin, he is not even looking to Alessandro Demarki to do a turn of pace. And once they get over the top of this climb, it is a quick descent. They then go through the feed zone, and then they're abruptly onto the next climb of the day. The following one is a Category 2 climb. It's a similar length to this one, but it's significantly steeper, with an average gradient of almost 8%. You can see by the graphic on the screen, Marcel Kittel, who's already won three stages in this year's race, He's in a group at some five minutes behind, but they're only two minutes behind the main peloton with the yellow jersey. Also in that group, we've got some of the other big sprinters. Mark Renshaw is in there. The French national champion, Arnaud Demar, and Ji Cheng, the first Chinese rider to ride the race. So in the group, we've got Joaquin Rodriguez, who was third in last year's Tour de France. So perhaps this should be the Cancellara Rodriguez group. Thirty-year-old Perik Kumier who sits at the front. Dumoulin for Giant Shimano. That's the Dutch Dumoulin as opposed to the Sammy Dumoulin from AG to Le Mondial. And Christian Meyer at the back of the group with his hand up looking for service with the team car probably still bridging the gap. A minute and three seconds as they went across the top. It was around about 38 or 40 seconds when they hit the bottom of the climb. So the horsepower of Tony Martin is proving too much for the group of 28. Astana at this point with everything under control. You can see the blue colours off to the right hand side of the screen. The dark blue colours of the Movistar team. It's Giovanni Visconti who's leading for them, the experienced Italian. Izaguera is the Spanish national champion, but their protected man is Alejandro Valverde. At the end of yesterday's stage, he said he was a little disappointed with his result, but to lose 19 seconds to Contador, it's not so bad in the end. He says he has a real hard time in the rain. And Vicenzo Nibali, he deals very well with the rain. He coped impeccably yesterday. He did concede three seconds, but it's not a great concern. Malverde comes to this race as the team leader for Movistar and I would suggest that that will be the last time he will be a team leader at the Tour de France for that squad. They've got the young, young Colombian on their team, Nato Quintana, who was second here last year. He won the Giro d'Italia this year but he's not riding the Tour de France. He'll be back next year and I'm sure he'll be the leader of the squad. 
The remnants of this shadow that you see, it dates back to 1279. It was restored in the 1990s. It became a historic and cultural hub. And in fact, this year, for the first time in June, it had a gypsy festival. I wonder how it went. Gilmia Enretta doing the job for Pierre Roland. Dries Fehlu is the rider who's managed to get in the break for the Breton Sachet team. Two riders in that breakaway for the BMC Racing Squad. Certainly a different approach for BMC Racing this year by comparison to what we've seen for the last three years. It's Emile Monard and Greg Van Avman who are in this chasing group for BMC Racing. Tinkoff Saxo colours to the right hand side of the screen. That's Raphael Micah. He put in a brilliant performance at this year's at Giro d'Italia. He was not originally on the list on the schedule to do the Tour de France this year. He was given outright leadership for the team at the Tour of Italy, where he finished in sixth position overall. Roman Kreuziger was then told, well, he won't be allowed to race because the UCI, they're not too happy with his blood passport. They think he's got a few questions to answer. That issue dates back to 2011. So Raphael Michael was quickly put into the team. But the pre-race press conferences, Bjarni Reese was stating that it was not a late call-up for Raphael Michael. He was always going to be in the squad. Not sure I believe that statement. Visconti getting the first of the Musette bags for Movistar. And it is a getter. He collects a second one. And I'm sure that that will work its way across to their team leader, Alejandro Valverde. There's Rafael Micah out of the saddle, the man that I was just speaking about. He did a lot of work yesterday. And wasn't it an impressive performance by Michael Rogers yesterday? He was the second last teammate there for Alberto Contador. The last man to do the job was Nicholas Roach. And Nicholas Roach was all re also pretty quick to go across the finish line and head to the podium and congratulate the stage winner, Daniel Cadre. Showed the Frenchman's popularity at the end of the day. The uh, remnants of the three chateaus. The oldest of which, the tower that stands in the middle. The first stones were laid for that tower back in 1150. And that group of 28 riders, according to Race Radio, they're now at 1 minute and 8 seconds behind Demarkey and Tony Martin. And it's going to be difficult to work out whether there'll be anybody left in that main peloton to do the chasing. Most of the big teams with favourites for stage honours are represented in that chasing group of 28. But if they just leave it up to the Europe car team to do the chasing, to try and catch this man, Tony Martin, they might be underestimating the strength of a man that I think would do fairly well if he entered the world's strongest man competition. The left knee is bandaged up, but we know that won't slow him down too much. He's got a long time to wait before we hit his favourite discipline. It's now the 13th of July, it's not until the 26th that we have the 54 kilometre individual time trial. Look at the gaps he's putting into the Italian Alessandro De Marchi as he makes his way around these turns. I think the pilot on the motorbike is getting a little nervous as well. Might want to open up the throttle on the straights and really distance himself a little bit. Or pull to the side of the road and let the faster moving vehicle go by. And Tony Martin, Alessandro De Marchi, they continue to take time on the main peloton. Their advantage now out to 3 minutes and 48 seconds. One of the good signs coming out of yesterday's stage was uh, Thibaut Pinot descended pretty well. The Frenchman, who was very nervous last year on the descents. So officially now it's at a minute and 19 seconds, the gap between the two leaders and the chasing group of 28s. Kevin Retza still on the front. And eventually, surely, somebody else has got to come towards the front and assist with the chasing. There's quite a few teams in there with more than one rider in the break. 
Code of Fetus, one example. They got Nicola Ede and Danny Navarro in this group. Katusha with Simon Spilak and also Joaquin Rodriguez. So one point. They've got to sacrifice. Choose which rider it is to sacrifice to do the chasing and close it down to put this group in with a chance to try and win the stage into Malouz. A little bit bumpy, rattling around the corners. Fortunately, there's been no rain today. Hopefully, the last of the rain is behind us. Yesterday, with the pouring rain, at the finish line, it was some 25 degrees, apparently, in London. And those in Yorkshire were sending through plenty of photos of the fine weather conditions that they're having. It has been a very wet edition of the Tour de France this year. A near 76 kilometres per hour at the front for Tony Martin. And he is still in the tuck position. Slipped through this roundabout without touching the brakes. And that does look like one lonely spot of rain on the lens of the motorbike. Let's hope it's not actually a genuine spot of rain and there might have been a little bit of water that's flicked up from one of the riders in the break. Four minutes and 11 seconds now their advantage. Back in the main peloton, Richie Port is getting a taste of what it's like to be a team leader in a Grand Tour. He's got some experience with having the pressure of being a team leader. He's done it in the past, but not at a Grand Tour. He was the leader of the squad for Team Sky at Paris-Nice last year when he managed to take the win. Trying to read that hand language from Perry Kumier. So with 92.2 kilometres left to race, let's now head across to Paul Sherwin and Phil Liggett. So we're looking here at the group as it continues in the high-speed chase, Paul, as we race down the valleys now before the next climb. Yes, yeah, so interestingly enough, there are five riders from the Europe car team in this group, and they're the riders in the dark green jerseys. We go switching to these beautiful uh, Vosian towns here. We're in the department of the O'Brien at the moment. So we're on the climb here now. This is a second category climb. Always difficult on television to show you just how hard these climbs are, Paul. Uh, but these are tough climbs in the Vosges. No, they are. And as I said earlier, we've had no respite since the start. We came out of the start starting gate this morning and it was almost immediately uphill. And uh, the pace was high. I mean, over the first part of the race, the average their average speed was 49 kilometers an hour that's just inside of 30 miles an hour it slowed down a fraction now Phil to about 43 or 44 kilometers an hour and that's still 27 miles an hour average speed over very very tough terrain magnificent crowd here and happens you say that the weather has improved quite dramatically today it's uh, gone up uh, much warmer although they have forecast the odd rainstorm no signs yet fingers crossed well, if you want to know what the gradient is of this climb, it's uh, coming in at around about 8%. That makes it rather a tough little day out in the saddle. Tony Martin happy, I think, to take second wheel on these steep slopes. Estonian flag flying. He rides very low gears, Tony Martin, trying to save all the energy. This has gone back to the chasing group of 28 riders with uh, five Europe car riders and the tour leader in the breakaway, Pierre Roland. The Britannia team, a wild card entry in white on the front, and they have not been there. They missed the breakaway yesterday, but until then, they were ever present uh, in the breakaway. As they continue now to try and uh, do something with Bryce Fellew today. Yeah, well, there you can see uh, the start banner there, 4.1 kilometres for the main field to the top of the climb. That's two and a half miles. And as I said earlier, it's, it's a nasty little climb at around about 8% and it's been given that uh, second category gradient. You know, the, gra the grades of the climbs are graded from fourth 
up to outside categorization. We haven't got to any of those yet, but there will be an awful lot once we start to get into the next few days. And it's in the outside categorization climbs that you can garner the most points. But these early climbs are important to try and get a few points in that competition. Well, Tony Gallopin in that second group, another half a minute advantage over this main field, and he will be the virtual race leader on the road. And that hasn't happened since we left Sheffield a week ago. Looking around, the over four and a half thousand feet short here. There's Blel Cladry in amongst the cars, going backwards just now. Little counter move here as we start to now close down. Rodriguez, who's in the breakaway, by the way, the man has ridden virtually last man throughout the tour so far because of his injuries, looks today as though he's recovered a little bit. He's been in all the attacks, and he's now racing the third place over the climb. Well, the reason for this, Phil, is uh, when you get a group of 28, as I started to mention just a little bit earlier on, you get a lot of passengers. A lot of guys are thinking, right, this is nice. I'm going to get a nice free ride here this afternoon. Well, I wonder if he jumped out there to get himself points because he's gone over the top of that climb in third place. So that's interesting for a man like your Riochim Rodriguez to think about that. Maybe that is going to be his new goal now that he knows he can't win this race overall. Yes, it's a, a very much a possibility. He wasn't third there, though, was that? It was like Nicola Ede there. He was third, OK. Yes, he was uh, definitely third coming out there. He sat up very smartly uh, and waited to uh, get picked up by the main field. So he'll get himself just a few points. There. The points for a second category climb when you go over the top, they're 5, 3, 2, 1. But looking at the gap between uh, this group and the two leaders, it's actually stretched out again to a minute and 37 seconds. Just having a quick look down there, uh, just over to the left-hand side, that is the convent of uh, St. Mark. They originally founded uh, in uh, 676 AD under the title of Saint Sigismond. It was restored in 1050. And the wealthy church was then placed under the patronage of Saint Mark. It was reduced to ashes due to a massive fire in 1101, and the monastery was rebuilt from 1105 onwards. And it was attached to the Abbey of Saint George in the Black Forest. It really is a magnificent building we're looking at there. There is a new church that's been built to just uh, towards one side we might get a chance to pick it up that was built in 1972 and there are a few other buildings added on in 1995 main field they won't really get much of a chance to see that as they move by we're looking now at uh, the gap back to the yellow jersey group which is led all of the time by team Astana Lots of psychological games going on over these kind of stages. Uh, we saw yesterday, and I was a little bit surprised to see on the running down towards the finish that uh, Vincenzo Nibali, whose team looked really good on the flat stages, uh, they seem to be a uh, fraction weak, and there's confirmation. Rodriguez uh, got himself uh, the third place, and Nicola Ede, who in fact is in fourth place at the start of the day, managed to get himself uh, a single point there. Here we see Astana doing the work. Team Sky, who have uh, well recovered, I think, from the loss of their leader, Chris Froome, and they found man willing to take his throne in Richie Port, who's the smallest of the riders in the black on the left there. And you know, Paul, he's up to third overall now. No, he certainly is. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's bear in mind that when we get to the next big climb of the day, there are 10 points available for the first rider to summit the first category climb. And, and I don't see these two uh, really getting pulled back before that point. We're just tickling 80 kilometres an hour going downhill here. That's around about 50 uh, miles an hour. I noticed the other day there was a tweet put out by Nicky Terpstra, and it was actually a tweet of his uh, onboard computer, and his maximum speed, the maximum speed he'd attained on the day, was 108 kilometres an hour, which is about 67 miles an hour. That's pretty fast on about uh, one inch of tyre. Yes, I think that's when you just don't think, you just do it. Uh, and it's uh, when you're in the comfort of your hotel, check it out. Uh, well... Tony Martin is a very, very fast and skillful descender, so he's a good man to be up there just now. And if uh, if DeMarchi can get those 10 points on the uh, climb of uh, La Markstein, which is the next climb of the day, then he would give him the lead in the King of the Mountains, which is the whole point of his attack today. 
Well, having uh, at least 30 riders ahead of the yellow jersey group and the green jersey group, because Peter Sagan is in the uh, group behind here, uh, it means that at the intermediate sprint point at uh, Linthal, uh, Peter Sagan, for the first time, Phil, since the start of this tour, could have a day off in his uh, sprinting for the green jersey points competition. Indeed, indeed. Well, they're coming up to the summit now of the third of the second category climb, the Col uh, the Cote de Gerbischwier. And uh, just as they approach the summit, it's going to be just on six minutes, uh, just under six minutes, five, 54 for the riders as they go over the top. Still a ways to go to put matters to rights, but at this moment in time, Vincenzo Nibali is not the leader of the Tour de France. No, that would be an honour which would be bestowed on Tony Gallopin, but there's still a long way to go, and I think as we get closer to the finish, and probably on the next, uh, well, the, the next first category climb, Phil, I think we might start to see uh, a little bit of assistance coming from the other teams. Team Sky are uh, sitting in the wings. For me, if I was the team management at Team Sky, I would hold back Team Sky and reserve them for the last week of the race. I wouldn't want to put too much pressure onto the shoulders of Richie Port. I would allow him just to ride as a free agent, if you like, for the next week and see how he lines himself up for the last week of the race. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, nobody wants the pressure of the Mayo Jean when we're heading to the Alps next. So, Blel Kadri in the red number there, the most aggressive rider of yesterday, had a very, very difficult climb uh, just coming up to the top of that climb there, the Côte de Gerbeschwier. Uh, peaking out at a maximum of uh, 600 metres or just about 2,000 feet above sea level. Now he's back in the contact with the main field and he can breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief. Uh, but now it will uh, roller coaster for the next few kilometres as we start to go over the Col de Bannestein, which is actually not a categorised climb, and then drop down into Linthal for the sprint competition point there, which is at 105 kilometres covered. For the gaps, well, they're stretching out. It's uh, almost between the two leaders we're looking at here, Tony Martin, who is a very successful professional rider, incredible in the individual time trial, three times world champion. Their gap now is stretching out to almost two minutes over the 27 chases. Somebody's been dropped from that group, and I can only produce, to presume that was Michael Albacini, who had that flat tyre. So, in the ascension of the climb of the Côte de Gerberswehr, it was 12.51 were the leaders. The group of Roland Gallopin actually went up there just one second faster, while the main field went up uh, a minute slower. But bear in mind that we'll see a little bit more organisation coming into the yellow jersey group as we get closer to the finish. It's Well, I'm not sure what happened there. Just a little bit of a problem there for uh, De Marchi. Yeah. It looks as if it, you know what can happen very often. He keeps looking at his hand, Phil, and what often can happen is uh, you can find a stone or something gets flicked up into your hand. And uh, he's obviously hurt himself uh, quite a bit there. You can tell by the way he's actually attempting to hold the handlebars. Yeah, I never actually saw that, Paul. But, you know, we've had these cases of riders that really doing their the hands some serious injury when they start to toy around with the computer magnets and things like that around by the, the spokes area of the wheel. Don't quite know what he did, but he's going to have a word with Cannondale. His team seems OK, although he's holding his... Ah, oh, he's got the water and poured it over. I don't know, we'll find out if we can. Might be a sting from a simple thing like a bee, of course. That's happened on the race already this year with Alessandro, per Alessandro Pataki. But certainly, uh, Tony Martin won't want to be left alone in the lead. He needs that man. Andre Greipel here at the back of a group of riders. He was in the breakaway. He now looks as though he's uh, now beginning to feel the pressure as well. An awful lot of riders, especially the sprinters, went off very very early today and as far as we know they are losing quite big time today it's a hard day phil uh, although as we said earlier the race organization have not called this uh, a mountainous stage if we were to add up the difference in altitude the riders covered by at the end of today it would probably be equivalent to three coals So in the King of the Mountains competition, we keep seeing uh, Kadri at the back. Uh, he's now being challenged by De Marci, who's in second place with nine points. Well, they're whipping up the turf a little bit now. The clock isn't justifying it because the two leaders are still pulling away from them, going out to 6'11". 
uh, but look at the gaps between wheels now we're crossing a valley road here as we go towards Lintal uh, which is this, the green jersey sprint town today but it's halfway up a climb as well as we then go on to the top of a first category hill uh, La Markstein and I don't think we've ever climbed that hill in the Tour de France before no, I had a quick look through the records as we see uh, one or two riders, Phil, have actually disappeared from that group. So that group, which was 28, uh, that's uh, Kevin Redzer in the dark green jersey of Europe car and Sylvain Chavanel, one of the animators of yesterday. He too, probably like Blel Kadri, Phil, uh, got uh, slightly heavy legs on a day like today. Yes, oh, this would have been a, a good stage for Chavanel, but not after the efforts he made yesterday. So they've got two of them back. We're down to 26 in the chase now. Uh, Lars Bohm has tried to get away himself, but I haven't seen any pictures of him trying to bridge up. Uh, he's off the back, so Lars has also been, been pulled off the back now. Yeah, I think uh, many riders uh, thought it was a good idea. That's one of those things when you come out of the starting gates, you see the breakaway form and you get into it, then realise, oh, I've got 110 miles to ride on a day like today. This is probably not the position that I want to be in, so the better part of valour, bearing in mind, We've still got two weeks of racing to go, and it's all about conserving energy and uh, trying to win stages if you can. He probably thought, I think I'll wait for the main field on an occasion like this. Now, there is an Orica Green Edge rider in that chase group. He does not appear on any of the listings, so I'm not too sure who it is. But there is a, a one rider in there that the referees have not transmitted his number. So we'll keep an eye out for him for the moment. We think it might be Christian Meyer. The Canadian who just came in at the last minute for Michael Matthews and also Michael Albacini was in that group but uh, we saw him have a mechanical incident and uh, all of a sudden he's disappeared from the computer screens as well uh, as we can see the two leaders though well there's no confusing here at all you know these stages uh, it's very narrow through the Vosges region of France here and we've only got a, a limited number of cameras to get into all of the groups and uh, race radio even has difficulties through these high mountain stages for the referees to relay back all the information but there's obviously Phil uh, no 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 challenge to the fact that the two leaders are Alessandro Di Marchi of Team Cannondale and Tony Martin of Omega Pharma Quickstep. The serious faces on the boys with Evans again today the group roll on they're calling it because uh, that's the top French rider overall he's seven minutes behind and the group Galapan because he's the lead of the tour now as we continue towards the finish today and the next challenge of the day there's Machado just peeping into our picture, the blue and white jersey of the NetApp Endura rider. He joined that team, they've got in the Tour de France. He's a, he's a very good rider. So looking at the two leaders now, uh, a quick uh, reminder of just what the race situation is. Uh, Alessandro Di Marci in the second place there in the lime green of Cannondale. Uh, Tony Martin in the black and white jersey of Omega Pharma quick step there uh, just one kilometer away from the intermediate sprint point at uh, Linthol the chasing group of 25 riders is at two minutes and 44 seconds while the main field concerning all of the overall contenders is at six minutes and 18 seconds now so far De Marchi has taken all of the points in the King of the Mountains competition as we flick across the road just a fraction there I think Tony Martin will get maximum points here very shortly, about 800 metres actually, Paul will be heading into Lintal, scene of the Green Jersey Points competition. Now Peter Sagan, uh, the leader of this competition by a big margin, is at the back of the race today. He's not enjoying his journey through the mountains, uh, so the crumbs are left for the rest of the riders to pick away here. These two have worked exceptionally well together. Now De Marchi has uh, won all of the King of the Mountains points while these riders have been together, so I would have thought, Phil, uh, it would be the right thing to do to allow Tony Martin to get himself yep. maximum points at the intermediate sprint point, and, of course, 1,500 euros, which is around about £1,200. Well, that's the order of play, taking a drink, but they're doing a very impressive ride, these two. They've got 25 riders chasing them, and they are getting no closer. The last uh, time check we have is that they're on two and three quarter minutes behind these two and at one stage they looked as though they're going to sweep them up they were within a minute of catching them they've not waited for those uh, gr that group of 25 behind at all here we go let's see and it's going to be the way you said paul this is the professionals uh, doing their job well Tony Martin isn't interfering in Alessandro De Marchi's King of the Mountains ambitions and so De Marchi letting Tony Martin take the points and the money.
both uh, both of those things there uh, he will take but you know what's more important is we're now just 15 kilometers away from the top of a first category climb and there are 10 points available for the first man to summit there and i'm sure in the back of his mind alessandro de Marchi, the winner of the king of the mountains competition in the criterium de dauphine which is a race that takes place pretty much in the alps in the month of june and is regarded as a selection race he'll be looking to get maximum points there Sun is out and that a uh, little bit more than expected today. They were forecasting rain showers, but so far it is all sun. Quick look at Tony Martin there. He's got the, the deep wedge uh, rims in, uh, the, in his bike today and that makes his uh, wheels just that little bit more rigid. They're somewhat uncomfortable to ride as well because of the rigidity, but it gives a little bit of assistance as well in the aerodynamics uh, on these road bikes. Martin is a strong, tough competitor, and the fact that that group of 28 riders were not able to catch the two leaders, I think, Phil, is pretty much down to the fact that it was a certain Mr. Tony Martin they were trying to catch, and he is three times champion of the world yeah. in the individual time trial. He's champion of Germany uh, in that discipline as well, and trying to catch him, you would have had to have a very big, strong, powerful team just working to pull him back into the fold. Well, at the moment, as we've gone back to that group, it's Europe Car with a lot to gain for their team leader in the breakaway, Pierre Roland. He's 7.34 behind overnight. He's making a big-time gain over Vincenzo Nibali, and it's it's a big-time gain. He is a great climber. He's been the king of the mountain to the Tour de France, Pierre Roland. This puts him right back in the race long-term, uh, not just for a couple of days. Yeah, but just look at the way the race is unfolding. We've got the two leaders on the road, Phil. They're looking at individual victory. They want to win the stage here this afternoon but in this group behind which has been reduced to 25 riders every time we look at this group there's only three guys doing the pacemaking everybody else is very very happy to be a passenger in this group even Tony Gallopin who is the best placed rider in the overall standings at the start of the day he's in 11th place he hasn't got his team riding on the front because they know how much Pierre Roland who's finished in the top 10 of the Tour de France on two occasions yep. is trying to get some time back and I've got a gut feeling today Phil that's actually going to go against Team Europe car this move. Yes, Roland spent a total of 11 days in the polka dot jersey throughout his climbing career, and he's a very, very good climber. And of course, he's won at two of the most revered sites at the Tour uh, in the Alps, the Alpe d'Huez himself, which he did in 2011, and in La Toussuire in 2012. And this is a chance to repair his damage, the damage done over the past week on the rough roads. Now we're entering his terrain. If he takes time today. The French are going to start seeing him as a real challenger. Yes, uh, by the way, uh, let's just remind ourselves that when he won that stage up to the top of Alpe d'Huez in 2011, he beat a certain Alberto Contador on those slopes, so he was really showing that he was one of the great climbers to come. And I think this year has been a little bit of a confirmation for him because he rode a superb Giro d'Italia. It's tough nowadays to ride the Giro d'Italia and then come up and race in the Tour de France, but I think they've got it right for this man, uh, and he is going to get through the Tour de France in good form. Certainly showing it today. This is their plan today. That's why uh, Kevin Retz has already been dropped. He did the early work at the front to keep them clear, he's paid the price, he's gone back to the pack, and let's hope he can hang on there. Six minutes 38 is the gap from yellow to the two leaders, but there's an interim gap of two minutes and 59 for the 25 riders left now chasing those two leaders. And again, to put it in... It was dropped very, very early on. They're talking of over eight minutes the gap, and it's uh, not looking too good. No, they've got to ride very, very hard. Uh, the sprinters find themselves uh, getting together on stages like this to, to work together to try and keep themselves inside of the elimination time. I just spot, uh, I think Matthew Heyman is in this group as well, over to the right-hand yes, side there early. for yep. Orica Greenedge. And also Mark Renshaw is in this group for Omega Pharma Quickstep. Uh, just sitting on the back as well, I can see the rider in the lime green jersey of Cannondale, that's Ted King. Did a lot of work over the early stages, now he's pretty much on the defensive. It's also the group, let's not forget, of Marcel Kittel. Now, what's, up, what's going on here? This is a little bit of a move, and it wasn't expected by Di Marchi, because Tony Martin has put in an attack here. 
No, that's not very friendly. Well, it's not very friendly, but, uh, you know, this guy, I think we'd better nickname him uh, Tony Turbo because he's an unbelievable rider. I think he's going to feel a lot more comfortable if he can get into a breakaway situation on his own. He's been in these situations many, many times throughout his career, and I think he'll just get down and get himself settled into his own rhythm as we start the slopes of this rather nasty climb. It wasn't that much of a, a powerful attack here. I think he could feel the fact that the De Marci was suffering a little bit and said, right, well, I'm going to go out on my own. I don't want to carry anybody towards the finish. Tony Martin on the climb here, which is the first category climb. If uh, De Marci gets up here in uh, second place, then he will have a total of 16, uh, 17 points. But because he's won this first category climb, he would still have the polka dot jersey tonight equal with Blel Kadri. Uh, so he can afford to stay in second because I think that was his target of the day But Tony Martin's target is not just to go over the top of this mountain in first place It's to fly over the top of the next one the Grand Ballon the big balloon and then charge down to Malouz and win the day uh, You've got to take your hat off to the way that uh, Omega Farmer Quickstep use their team tactics They came here uh, built with Mark Cavendish as a man to win the flatter stages Mark crashed out day one and they totally rethought their tactics and they're playing a different card every day. Well, they've been able to turn around uh, the team spirit, if you like, Phil. Uh, they've seen themselves down after day one. They came here to hope to dominate the sprints with Mark Cavendish. But they've rethought the game. They've come out uh, of the corner fighting and they got the stage victory with Matteo Trentin. And now they know that the guys like Tony Martin have good form coming into this race. So why not look at a stage like this when uh, you can expect the possibility of each other so just looking now at this uh, second group on the road the race situation is Tony Martin has just in fact uh, moved away from the front end of uh, the two-man breakaway Alessandro De Marci is in second place he is uh, just looking for 10 seconds and it's two minutes and 20 seconds back now down to the group of 24 riders and 622 back to the main field the main field which is uh, being led by team Astana so Tony Martin now with 58 kilometers to go is looking for the possibility of trying to win himself the stage. So the weather is starting to change now. It's still bright on the finishing line. It's dry on the finishing line, but out on the climb as they start to get to the summit of the first category climb, the climb of Le Marxteen. Uh, that, in fact, uh, we're, is noticing that there's a bit of a cloudburst coming in, and that's going to make it a bit more precarious on the descent. The riders from uh, Europe car are grimacing quite a bit as they too now start to ride into this little bit of a storm with Joachim Rodriguez, number 21, sitting at the back of the group. This may well go to the advantage of Tony Martin, who is a very tough character. As I said earlier, he's won seven races so far this season. And he could well be looking to get himself a stage victory here in the Tour de France as he now uh, lines up towards the final four kilometres before he gets himself to the top. That's the top of the first category climb. It goes down for just a little bit, some uh, false undulating rows before he then kicks up to the top of the final climb of the day. And that is the, the climb of the Grand Ballon. Uh, the Ballon d'Alsace, by the way, was the first uh, big mountain uh, included into the Tour de France in 1905 before they moved down to the Pyrenees with the addition of the Pyrenean climbs. Grimaces all over the face uh, of these riders now. Uh, Kemener is the rider in second position. Uh, Pichot is the rider in first. Uh, the gap is 2 minutes and 50 seconds to the group uh, Roland Ga uh, uh, Ro Roland Galopin. Against the yellow because the yellow jersey group on Tony Martin's now slipped over eight minutes uh, behind here. Martin is not looking like a man who's going to put up the white flag today. He's going to lose on his own. No, certainly, uh, I think 50 kilometers. Uh, this man, once he goes over the top, uh, he could ride this final kilometre, this final 50 kilometers, or just about 31 miles, in just over the one hour, maybe an hour and five minutes. He's a great individual time trialist. He's champion of Germany, three times champion of the world. He has no fear at all as he comes to the top of this climb of riding on his own.
Martin, 10 points for the first category climb now, slight change never know would you with the crowd blocking the road like this now DeMarkey should hold on for second yes sir the question is what are these roads going to be like on the descent as he precariously picks his way around the corner over the top of the climb further down the climb the riders are also now climbing their way into this cloud burst this is the second group on the road and it certainly is not the 25 man strong group that it was as they started this climb So Amel Moana is a rider from uh, BMC Racing who's managed to jump clear. He wears number 144. He's looking for a little bit of freedom and respite this afternoon while back in the group behind. His teammate TJ Van Garden uh, must uh, having a, a slightly easier day off. He moved up yesterday, TJ Van Garden, to 13th place overall despite a lot of bad luck over the previous 48 hours. Yes, Samuel Moana is normally a man who looks after TJ Van Gordon, always rides by his side today, he's been given the freedom to join the front group and he's going to hurt this group at the moment. A little bit surprised that Joaquin Rodriguez hasn't started to put a move in himself. He's the only man I would have thought in a normal condition who could do anything about Tony Martin's escape right now. Yes, but the group uh, that we're looking at, Phil, uh, are uh, over three minutes behind the lone leader, uh, Alessandro De Marchi from Team Canada. He's caught to halfway across the gap in no man's land. As we start to see uh, the difficulties, we get closer to the summit of this climb. The crowds are certainly turning out, but as you can see, the, the damage is being done. That's Sergio Paolino, by the way, the rider in the fluorescent yellow uh, jersey of Tinkoff Saxo. He's one of the teammates. Schnell, by the way, I'm sure you can pick that up, Phil. That means uh, just keep going fast. Yes. Quicker, quicker. Well, that's uh, a bit mean, really, because he can't go much quicker. And this is Thiago Machado now. Another man with a lot to gain tonight. He could be in the top two if this breakaway stays clear. Started the day, just six minutes, seven seconds behind. The clock is telling us now that peloton is over eight, and that's why he's riding now as well. Well, here is Joachim Rodriguez. His nickname is uh, Purito. He had a very difficult, nasty crash in uh, May in the Giro d'Italia. Now he's trying to ride himself back into form, and these are the kind of stages that he certainly likes the profile of, and I think he's just trying to stay at the front end of this group, Phil, to think about a few King of the Mountains points. The rider moving up alongside him is also thinking about King of the Mountains points because that's Nicolas Edé, and he won the King of the Mountains competition in last year's Tour of Spain. We're just hearing on race radio that Alessandro De Marchi has gone over the top. He's got second place and there's a real battle here for the rest races now. Ede is on the left, Rodriguez is on the right. This is going to be a sprint on top of a first category climb. Advantage Rodriguez. Well, Rodriguez, I think Phil there, he has announced the colour. Now that he knows he can't win the Tour de France anymore this year, his next goal is going to be a polka dot jersey. Now that is a serious sprint and uh, we are in fact only sprinting for third place but at the end of the day this could be very important or most certainly when we go down to tomorrow there is third place for him as he goes across there's 151 now that's the leader of Team Europe car trying to keep himself warm as we line ourselves up for the descent and that is Pierre Roland. So 47 kilometers to go for Tony Martin. He has a two minute advantage over Di Marchi. Three minutes and four seconds over the group of 20 riders now, which contains uh, Tiago Machado and Tony Gallopin, who's the best placed rider in that group. And it's now eight minutes and 20 seconds back to the main field. But again, it's all a question of adding up the time over the full three weeks of this race. And maybe they've decided, well, we can pass the leadership over to Tony Gallopin because tomorrow, let's not forget is a mountain top finish tomorrow is a very difficult stage and uh, you can uh, give away five minutes today and pull them back tomorrow when you start to think about what tomorrow's finish is going to be like because as we make our way up to the uh, la planche de belfi moving away from uh, moulouse tomorrow it is a nasty mountain top finish uh, and there are a number of first category climbs we've got the petit ballon we've got the plus plaza vassal uh, which is a first category climb then the col de Ode the Col de la Croix, the Col de Chevre, and these are hard, long climbs. And will be, I think, tomorrow will be the, the Queen stage of the Vosges, if you like, and we finish in the Haute Seine before the last climb of the day, the Planche des Belfies, which is a six kilometer climb. 
So all of the time that is pulled back today can be lost on tomorrow's stage. And so really it is a question of making sure every effort that you make is actual effort that pays for something. And today, we saw the move yesterday by uh, Blel Kadri. He did a superb ride. He won himself the King of the Mountains competition. He won himself the individual stage. But today, he's paying for it. He can't even stay in contact today with the yellow jersey group. And that may be why Team Astana have decided, Phil, to pull the plug a little bit. And they're thinking about tomorrow. Because throw away five minutes today, pull it back tomorrow. Well, tomorrow is an horrendous day in the mountains. It is a real mountainous stage. Four first category climbs, including the last climb with, where the points are doubled uh, under the rules. So it's a big day tomorrow for everybody, and the leaders are conscious of this. And so, as we've seen, DeMarkey has gone over the top two minutes, ten back. And the group roll on Galapan, and Galapan at the moment is still the leader, just over three minutes back, while the peloton still toil on this climb of La Markstein. And uh, Tony Martin, who had an up and a down tour a year ago in the Tour de France, crashing on day one, briefly visiting the hospital, and uh, nine days later winning the time trial on the northern borders of France. Here he is now in the reign of the Vosges, at it again. And few would bet he couldn't hold these riders off. He's got very good form. Now, Marcel Kittel, the French champion, Arnaud de Mar, they are the sprinters, and they are 15 minutes behind. And they've got to be very careful, Paul. They don't finish outside the time limit today. Yes, because the time limit is not as long as it might be on a mountainous stage today. Today's uh, time limit, in fact, is only uh, what they call uh, an, an average uh, stage, uh, uh, a stage with the uh, parkour accidente. It's certainly not uh, a nice day out on the roads this afternoon because look at this fog coming in. It makes it very difficult, makes it cold for the riders uh, taking in the air as they start to, to pick up the descents. And again, these are the roads, uh, these are the kind of climbs that I always hated because you get to the top of the first category climb and there actually is no descent yet. You've still got to keep going to the top of the third category climb, the Petit Ballon. The Grand Ballon, sorry. The Grand Ballon, yes. So the flag of the Isle of Man, though, which has been following us since the start in uh, Harrogate. Eight minutes 30 as the peloton come up here. And uh, if we get over the top of the Grand Ballon, and they've still got a very good lead, then I think we can, uh, we can expect uh, a change of jersey tonight. Been a tough day even so for the riders of Astana but they haven't showed signs of panic they haven't been ordered to chase this group down they've just kept it uh, reasonably close but eight kilometers eight minutes is quite a long way when they're climbing mountains between them and uh, the main riders up front this is the leader now starting the last climb of the day just 1.4 kilometers of the Grand Ballon and once over the top of this, we're going to the highest point of the stage. Well, just over to the right-hand side, he was getting uh, a little bit of information, and hopefully that information will inspire him, because uh, he now has a huge gap over De Marchi, who I think is very shortly going to get picked up by the chasing group of 20 riders, and they are 3 minutes and 12 seconds behind Tony Martin, and 8 minutes and... 30 seconds to the group of the yellow jersey and uh, that is a big gap but it's five minutes between the yellow jersey group and the group of Tony Martin and Tony Martin uh, did mention that he thought that uh, there was a possibility on the Vosges mountain stage of him grabbing the yellow jersey that's why he's fought over the first week of this race to keep himself at the top end of the leaderboard and what a coup that would be for team Lotto Belisol who's still got a very serious uh, challenger for a, a top podium position in Jürgen Vandenbroek who started the day in 10th place overall one kilometer to go now for Tony Martin to the summit of the Grand Ballon and then he can uh, tighten his straps lock in his shoes and think about the big charge down to the finish it's approximately a 40 kilometers 25 miles to go from the top of the climb down towards Mulhouse and the first uh, the first uh, 20 or so are pretty much downhill, so he'll be averaging close to 50 kilometers an hour down that part of the course. When it's uh, lost so far in the Tour de France, so to uh, any chance in Paris. He's seen him coming now, DeMarkey, can he hang on? R Joachim is going for the King of the Mountains long term here. 
eight and a half percent, Phil. But you know, this man, Joachim Rodriguez, in second position there, is uh, just looking for a single point at the top of the climb. Alessandro Di Marchi, just looking, look at the face on him here. He knows he needs that point. He will still get the lead in the King of the Mountains competition because he's won more top mountain tops than anybody else. But still, I think out of pride, he would like to get it. But hard to rival a guy like Purito, Joachim Rodriguez. Well, he may not have calculated that the jersey is his tonight. But will it be this man's in Paris? Because he's reset his sights now. Joaquim Rodriguez looks 61 and a half minutes. He's lost since we left Leeds. Uh, an all chance of a, a podium in Paris. So now he wants polka dot. And of course, tomorrow, Paul, four first category climbs, double points at the end. It's a massive day in the mountains. Don't ever count this man as down and out. He's a great champion. In fact, you can just see the Spanish, uh, the colours of the Spanish flag around his sleeves. He's a former Spanish national champion. He's a great champion. He was hoping to win the Giro d'Italia this year, but he crashed out dramatically. Here he's trying to find some form, and look at this. That's a hard way to get a single point, but as you say, Phil, that single point might be very important coming down to the end. And in fact, today, he's climbed up into fifth place in that competition. Yes, he's come right out of uh, nothing into fifth place. He had no points until today. Uh, Spilak, his teammate, sat here at the back, just holding on to the coattails. Uh, as the group goes over the top, the gap is about 2 minutes and 58 seconds for the chase now, and that's against Tony Martin. Everybody in between has been swept up. This is Martin now starting to show us the art of descending here. So Tony Martin uh, getting down into this rather precarious and dangerous uh, tuck position, that position adopting as much as he can into the position of a downhill ski racer. And in the straight, uh, he will probably touch uh, around about 90 kilometers an hour, which uh, co co correlates to about 55 miles an hour. There's De Marchi. Now that he's been caught, he's going to take on board as uh, much... Uh, as much food as he can to keep the energy levels topped up. The group uh, containing Kittel and Demar, the sprinters, well, they are quite a long way behind. I think they're about 10 minutes behind the yellow jersey group, and still the yellow jersey group is under control of Team Astana. This will put a lot of pressure on them. The other teams, uh, teams of uh, Tinkoff, Saxo Bank, they will be quite happy to let that team do all of the pacemaking, hoping it will weaken them for an attack that might come tomorrow or even next week. Around the corner, it's starting to get a little drier on the roads and sometimes these are much more dangerous conditions when you come down uh, a road like this it's nice and dry then you come into a part of the road that's uh, not been sheltered from the rain and you get a little bit of uh, moisture on the surface and that's when accidents happen but Tony Martin is a very good bike handler Yes, and meanwhile, as we look at the peloton toiling its way still up the Grand Ballon, they're not very far from the summit of the last climb of the day, then they better start thinking about this eight minutes, eight second gap, because it is going to be very close by the finish, but at the moment, Tony Gallopin could take the best part of two minutes into tomorrow's stage as the race leader, and uh, that might keep him in yellow for a couple of days. This is still one yard. They're racing down the mountain here, but they're after him now. The peloton trying to bring him back. 37, 38 kilometers left to the finish for the peloton. They're a kilometer from the top of the last climb, the Grand Ballon. El Valls I don't see on Tony the front. Martin, I meant Tony Gallopin. Tony Gallopin will be dreaming about that. And in fact, he kind of uh, predicted it a fraction, Phil, because he had said that he felt quite comfortable, not in the high mountains. He knows of his own limitation when it comes to the big high mountains. Once we start to get into the rarefied air of 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 feet in altitude. So as far as he's concerned, this is his last possible crack at getting the yellow jersey this year. That's uh, Maya coming back, the rider from Orica Green Edge. He was in that big breakaway group a few moments ago but over the final kilometers of the climb he was dislodged and he'll see the comfort of the main field but coming back to this descent it is a, a real rapid descent uh, we will see speeds approaching uh, 90 to 100 kilometers an hour going down here which are, are between 55 and 60 miles an hour going downhill it's not a real technical you can see these are good sweeping bends the only concern for me is if there are any corners that might be just a little bit humid going around and that's when you see the wheels coming from underneath you 
Well, they're descending very sensibly and they're not really applying the pressure in that peloton. The situation overall at the moment is that Tony Martin leads, 19 riders remain together, around 250 behind, and then the peloton, the big bunch we're looking at here, is uh, eight minutes. Well, the man who's doing a lot of work at the moment in the chase group, immediate chase group of 19, is of course the rider in the red, and that's Tony Gallop. And you know, he could be looking at his first ever jersey in the Tour de France very, very shortly. We're looking at 34 kilometres, 21 miles still to race. I think Astana wanted to shift that jersey today simply because tomorrow is a real battle in the Vosges Mountains for first category climbs. And just think about what that does to the team as well because he's also got uh, the Belgian rider Greg Van Avermaet in that group with him and uh, he is a solid competitor. We saw him almost take a stage victory the other day when he escaped on the running towards the finish with Peter Sagan. I think that will also take a little bit of pressure off TJ Van Garderen because Tony Gallopin is a teammate of TJ Van Garderen. Gardens. Now, if he was to take the overall lead today, that means tomorrow, going into the mountaintop finish, the team car for Team BMC will be number one team car in the convoy. Now, that's good for the morale. And just getting a, a jersey into the team like that, it takes a bit of pressure off the team and makes them more relaxed going into the next days of racing. Well, the time it took to climb uh, the Grand Ballon was just over 4 minutes and 11 seconds for Tony Martin. He flew up that climb. Uh, Joaquim Rodriguez was 37 seconds slow and the peloton climbed it 32 seconds slower so Martin is still moving away uh, as we start uh, back to what really is his favorite racing ground now fast lone time trialing and going downhill yeah just to put it into uh, perspective a little bit Phil uh, the uh, the race uh, computer is saying that uh, he will stay clear down towards the finish and on the downhill part of the course, because of this man's ability to ride uh, an individual time trial, he's a great time trial. As we've said a number of times, he's three times champion of the world. He's current champion of the world. The important thing is that he's not going to lose very much of his advantage over the next 20 kilometers going downhill. Tony Gallup on the front of the pack. Computer telling us uh, Martin will win by a minute and 27 seconds at the moment. Computers, of course, can make mistakes. Well, let's see, because the peloton, uh, the man that's beginning to sense there's a yellow jersey for waiting for him now is Tony Gallopan. He's on the front. He's anxious now to drive this chase, not to catch Martin, but to beat Nibali. Well, Ali Sebastien Minard. As we can see here, that's uh, Bryce Velu in the white jersey. He's won a, he, he won a very, very impressive stage into Andorra a number of years ago. And uh, he's quite comfortable on climbs like this. Uh, but Tony Martin must be really dreaming here this afternoon. Looks like Fabian Cancellara actually recovered a fraction on the descent there as well, because I think he's got himself back into this group. Machado in the blue there. This could be a nice coup for NetApp Endura as well because uh, Tiago Machado started six minutes, seven seconds back overnight. Big move by the wildcard squad to put a man right up in the top three in the Tour de France. Thibaut Pinot, one of the youngsters from France at 24 years of age. As uh, we get back up here, this is Tony Gallopin. Well, he knows today it's a big day and he doesn't care about anybody else in this group. He's at 25 kilometers to go for Tony Martin. Hammering around all of these corners, uh, Tony Martin. He certainly is not uh, taking any prisoners, and neither is this man, too. He's using all of the technical corners now to try and open up a, a slight advantage over everybody else. And in fact, he's uh, really going around these corners very, very quickly indeed. He, too, also knows that he's got around about 30 minutes of effort, which could be one of the most important 30 minutes of effort in his whole cycling career to date. This is a man who last year won himself the San Sebastian Clinic, and he's the virtual yellow jersey on the road and that's why he's riding like this he knows he doesn't care about finishing fourth or fifth on the stage at this point he's dreaming of yellow in his mind all there is is that yellow jersey on the show on his shoulders on the podium on the 13th of july which is the day before bastille day and what a celebration that would be for france after getting themselves the victory on a stage yesterday the lead in the king of the mountains competition and why not a yellow jersey on bastille day and what a coup that would be this is Pino.
So as we go down, uh, and still insisting back in the pel in that peloton, uh, Thibaut Pino trying to steal a few seconds. The yellow jersey is the is there. I think yes, he's probably uh, made a decision not to chase this breakaway down today, Paul, because he knows what tomorrow holds. It'll be a battle which will involve Contador tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow is a very difficult mountain finish. Uh, it's uphill for the final seven kilometres or four miles of the race, and we've seen how much damage that climb, the Planche de Belfi, can do. Tony Martin, he's not thinking about tomorrow. As far as he's concerned, it's one day at a time, and uh, he's trying to just get down this uh, race as dis descent as quickly as possible into that rather dangerous tuck position but it makes him very aerodynamic and he can push his speed up to close to 55 miles an hour when he gets into that tuck position but don't try it at home because it's very difficult to maneuver your bike in that position you've got to take your hat off to this man now and this is the power of the yellow jersey of the tour de france he wants it and he wants to make doubly sure he gets it now he needed a lead over nibbly of 327 he's got more than that now but he wants to show off as well well, he does. Uh, he's not taking any prisoners at all on this descent. He's keeping the pace as high as possible. He's not really overexpending his energy. You don't use that much more than anybody else when you're going downhill as fast as this. But what it does do is it acts as a carrot to the riders in that group uh, behind him. It keeps the gap. It conserves the advantage, which is still... Well, it's just inside of five minutes now. But if he can cross the line three minutes and 27 seconds ahead of Vincenzo Nibali, he will be a Frenchman in the yellow jersey on the eve of Bastille Day. Now he comes as 20, he hits 25 kilometers to go. He comes from a very, very strong cycling family. His dad was a cyclist, uh, three brothers, all professional cyclists, uh, Joel Galopin, Alain Galopin, who is a team manager on the uh, international circuit, and Guy Galopin, who actually raced on the same team as I did, uh, the team La Redoute in the 1980s. <laughs> they know <laughs> they know exactly what it means they know Martin's power they know he can't be caught now this is a great moment now look he started the day 18 minutes behind Nibali he's only going to gain only he's going to pull back eight but he's nowhere near enough there's no yellow for him it's the moment that's for him Yes, and uh, what's more important, Phil, is that uh, when you see a guy like this who's been at the front of the race for over 100 miles, he's still riding at 44 kilometres an hour, which is 27 and a half miles an hour. The crowd have run out to the side of the road now, been watching this on television for the last two or three hours, and they know this man has put in a sterling performance. And he's one of those riders who's had such an incredible up-and-down relationship with the Tour de France. Going back to uh, the Olympic Games a couple of years ago, if you remember, he, he prepared for for the uh, individual time trial there and he actually crashed and broke his wrist during the Tour de France. The three with the most again, the three men at the front of the race, Galopin, Roland and they've just changed now but Machado was the third man in that blue jersey. The virtual leaders of the Tour now, they know what they've got, they're riding themselves into the ground here to make sure that they move up after a full day of trying to gain time on the yellow, they don't want to lose it now. Well, Tony Martin sees another banner here. This should be the banner that will tell him he's just got to five kilometres to go to the finish. Beneath the heavy skies as we head into Malou's, five kilometres or three miles to go for Tony Martin. He is about uh, six minutes at the most from the finish at the way this man races the kilometres. Well, no signs of emotion. Uh, there is urgency and emotion, though, in the second group on the road. Uh, they're not uh, going to get uh, the victory on the stage here this afternoon, but uh, for Pierre Roland of Team Europe Car, it's a question of moving up a little bit higher in the overall standings. He uh, started the day uh, quite a long way down but wanted to keep himself as a possible challenger for a top 10 finish down towards the end so too uh, Tiago Machado he wasn't too far down at the start of the day he was only looking for six minutes he too will be placing himself right up in amongst the leaders tonight straight road now as he takes Tony Martin into town if we're thinking who might win the sprint behind I'd watch out for Rojas of the Movistar team there's no other sprinters uh, as quick as he is in that back group, I don't think. And he will be the one to try and take out 
the uh, best of the rest now the man in blue Tiago Machado came over to this team net up Endura. they got a wild card place in the Tour de France he is a very very good stage race rider no, he certainly is. He's a great climber as well who's come across to this uh, NetApp Endura squad and that's why he's quite happy to keep the pace high. He knows three or four minutes, maybe even five minutes when the clock stops at the end of the day could be extremely important for him at the end of the three-week tour because he could see himself uh, finishing this bike race inside of the top ten after three weeks of racing. The effort still being made here by the chase group. The gap still extending, 8.23, and even the chasers have nudged out just a couple of seconds over Nibali. Martin is eating them and pushing them way into the background. But the peloton are just about holding on to the losses on that chase group. It's going to be around a minute and 40 seconds for the yellow. One kilometre has gone over the head of Tony Martin. This is going to feel unbelievable to the German cyclist now. He won a time trial in Grenoble, but now he's winning what he always wanted, a road race in Malouz. And people, Phil, always ask us, why do guys go out into the breakaway? Because the breakaway always gets caught. Well, on this occasion, Tony Martin has gone out to prove that he is the exception to the rule. A smile, he waves to his team management, we did it guys, the plan we talked about last night, get me in the early break, let me ride alone, and then I'll do the rest for you, and he's done it. Tony Martin, a time trial champion of the world, time trials to a road race victory of the Tour de France. No time worries, he's not racing with seconds, he's racing for pure victory. And boy, is he going to celebrate with the two-arm salute. One final look over his shoulders. This is the moment for Tony Martin, one of the best victories of his career. I did it. Well, he did it pretty much on his own. Uh, yes, he had a certain amount of help from uh, Alessandro Di Marchi over the early part of this race, but when it came down to uh, having to finish it off himself, he didn't ask for any help at all. What an amazing ride by that man to pull that one off. Now these boys will race down to the line because for them time really does count. Every second counts for Tony Gallopan because every second he can nudge away from the yellow jersey will move him a little bit safer into the yellow jersey tonight to take into this race tomorrow on what is a very, very hard stage. Well, just looking here, Phil, uh, just spotting uh, Greg Van Avermaet in the white glasses there. I might have got a bit uh, carried away by the excitement early on. Greg Van Avermaet did used to ride for Lotto Belisol before he swapped across to BMC Racing, but he was never actually a teammate of Tony Gallopin, who last year rode for the Radio Shack squad. And, uh, in fact, that may be why Fabian Cancellara did a few pulls at the front there, because they were teammates just 12 months ago. But uh, whatever happens, we do know Tony Gallopin is going to be the man who will pull the yellow jersey on at the end of today for France well the work being done here by Gautier for Roland uh, Roland will come out of his slipstream soon every second count Cyril Gautier has driven himself into the ground uh, there were five riders on Europe car originally now there are just two left Gautier the last faithful man the peloton lining up for the sprint uh, Movistar's Rocas on paper is the fastest finisher but I can't see him at the moment he's right down the back of the field maybe he's not interested in going anywhere as they race for the line and Pierre Roland is going to go under the one kilometre. Well, uh, talking about Greg van Avermaet uh, for BMC, he could very well be the man looking to get himself second across the line. He's shown us over the last couple of days that he's got some real serious form and he's sitting there in uh, third position. That's him for Team BMC. We've looked at a stage of almost 41 kilometres an hour here this afternoon, but more importantly, what is going to be the gap between Tony Gallopin's group and the yellow jersey group of Vincenzo Minibali? It needs to be three minutes and 28 as they start the sprint to the line. Well, failure in the white is going to have a dig for this Van Avermaet is in second wheel here Rockas doesn't look to be interested Cancellara in the black he's going to have a go he packs a good sprint when he wants to sprint Fabian Cancellara but is he going to open up and allow Greg Van Avermaet the victory here as they come up towards the line it's time that counts as far as the majority feel here's the kick for the line now uh, BMC's Greg Van Avermaet Cancellara cheekily taking the slipstream of Van Avermaet and watch out because Cancellara can finish fast 
just when he wants to. And that was close on the line. It'll go either way, that one. We have a look at the photograph. But the clock, Paul, what was it? Well, it doesn't matter. I've started my clock uh, anyway, Phil. It needs to be uh, 3.27 was the amount he started behind. So once it hits 3.28, then uh, Tony Gallopin is definitely in the lead of this bike race. But just looking at the time gaps uh, a little bit further down the road, they're not going to wipe that away in the last few metres. And I think everybody knows. Well, this is the scene now for the man who is the next Mayo Jean. We've had the same leaders in Sheffield on day two, but now we're on day nine of the Tour de France, and this man knows, and I think somewhat intentionally, he wanted to pass that jersey on. Well, when you add, uh, Phil, uh, 3.27 onto the finishing time of Tony uh, Gallopin there, it's uh, 6 minutes and 10 seconds, and once it's gone past the 6 minutes and 10 seconds on the clock after the winner, well, then Tony Gallopin will be the overall leader of the race this afternoon. He'll wait to be convinced before he actually says, yes, I am the leader. It's 4 minutes now, 2 minutes, 10 seconds for these boys to make it home. Astana bringing their team leader in here. They haven't fully chased today. We'll see what happens tomorrow when we have a real battle in the Vosges Mountains. Four first category climbs. We finish on top of uh, the biggest of them all. It looks OK. We're looking for the, uh, three kilometres to go, Paul. I think uh, we can all start congratulating Tony Gallopin. A Frenchman will lead the Tour de France on Bastille Day tomorrow. Yes, three kilometres, Phil, at speeds like this is going to take them more than three minutes to get to the finish line. Uh, my clock, which I clocked uh, to zero when Tony Gallopin crossed the line, has already been ticking for a good two minutes. So, in theory, well, in practice, now it's going to be yes. a brand new leader overall tonight and it will be a Frenchman on the eve of Bastille Day and his name is going to be Tony Gallopin. It's going to be so the sun shines in Malouze. Uh, it's been a weekend for the French. Yesterday, Blel Kadri won the stage at Jérôme. Today, it is Tony Gallopin who takes over the race lead. 7.46 as they cross the line. So we'll have to compute the new gap. It's around about a one minute and a half advantage now for tomorrow for Tony Gallopin. So, just looking down here, uh, his confirmation of the stage. Tony Martin won by 2 minutes and 45 seconds ahead of Fabian Cancellara, who led them home there. He just got himself across the line ahead of Greg Van Avermaet. Uh, Tom Dumoulin, fourth place. Uh, JJ Rojas in sixth. Bryce Fellu in ninth place and uh, Machado up there in tenth. But this is the moment when this man knew that he got himself the victory. He knew he was comfortable, he knew he had plenty of time to cruise to the finish. He's not concerned about uh, defending uh, his lead when it comes up to the finish of the, the Planche de Belfi tomorrow because all he was riding for today was individual glory and a stage victory for Germany and for Omega Pharma Quickstep who now make their tally two stage victories. Yes, it was all about Tony Martin, a great individual time trialist and a brilliant solo effort. Put a damper on it, Paul. Tony Martin was rode to a plan today, absolutely brilliantly uh, constructed plan, which worked out for him. But we saw what happened yesterday to Blel uh, Kadri. He finished off the back today. But here we are. Tony Gallopin uh, leads by that 134 over Nibli, who goes down to second. Machado up to third. Full sank down to fourth and Port down to fifth.